This happened a few years ago. It was supposed to be the ultimate road trip me, Ezra, and a beat-up old camper van we scored cheap. Ezra and I have been buddies since middle school, always dreaming of hitting the open road after finishing college. But sometimes, life's funny when it kicks your expectations down a dirt track into oblivion. We rolled through Idaho, aiming for those big sky, empty spaces, you know the type. Pulled off towards Sawtooth National Forest, drawn by the jagged mountain views and promise of quiet woods. Found a spot right near a bubbling creek, not another soul in sight. Paradise at first glance. Only a few hours in, I should have noticed the silence of the place no birds, no breeze rustling leaves, just stillness. Looking back, that should have been the first red flag. But when you're young and thinking yourself invincible, sometimes intuition whispers when it should damn well yell. After sunset, Ezra wanted to crack open a few beers around the fire. Standard camping stuff. It's funny now, I guess, to think it all started so casual. I noticed a half-buried rock near the fire pit, and curiosity, always been my downfall, got the better of me. Started digging and unearthed what looked like a rusty old trap, kind used for fur back in the pioneer days. Creepy, yeah but something about it felt different. Showed it to Ezra, but he couldn't have cared less, busy regaling me with some epic city escape tale as usual. I kept fiddling with the thing, a compulsion building up inside me. Ezra called me obsessed, laughing. We had that typical back-and-forth thing going on. Maybe he was right, but hey, a bit of an explorer spirit never hurt anyone. Or so I thought. He eventually drifted off, and the dying fire left just those dancing shadows creeping along the edge of our clearing. You ever sit alone near a wilderness campfire at night? It's something eerie about it, something primal. Something in that old trap started rattling like clockwork in my hands. And that's when I heard the footsteps snap a twig somewhere deep in the woods. Ezra slept on. No clue that every nerve in my body screamed danger. It came again, crunch of heavy boots. Panic flared up, mixed with cold, logical calculation. The RV was my one shot at escape. Lunge for it, fumbling with the door, too slow. A massive hand closed over my shoulder, wrenching me backward. He was tall, gaunt like he'd spent his life bent beneath the weight of too hard labor. Old minor clothes hung loose on his frame, worn face hidden in shadow. Had that wildness some men get when they lived too far from anything resembling society. An axe hung slack in his other hand, moonlight catching the chip steel. Then a whisper, raspy like he hadn't spoken in years. This my land. What's mine is mine. Terror cut my breathing short. But with it came a burst of desperate rage. Elbow smashed back into his ribs, forcing a surprise grunt out of him. That flicker of weakness was all I needed. Dove and Rolb broke free into the trees. Ran like the devil was on my tail, which honestly wasn't that far off the mark. Trees blurred together, heart trying to hammer out of my chest. He didn't yell, didn't speak, nothing but the steady crunch of those damn footsteps keeping pace. Like a predator toying with its prey. Finally, my path veered into thick undergrowth near the creek. That's when I stumbled on them. Campers couple in their mid-forties, judging by the fancy gear. Should have felt some relief, the first sign of normal folks in ours. Instead, just more horror. They lay side by side in their sleeping bags, throats gaping in ragged slashes. My stomach heaved, no blood, none at all. That man-man must have drained them to lessen the mess. It's an image carved into my soul even now. He knew their screams wouldn't carry this far, 
had this whole ritual perfected. Back into those suffocating woods I ran. Every snap twig sounded like gunfire. Every flicker of firelight was him closing in. I finally came out by a logging road, where, by some crazy luck, two college kids on a late-night drive spotted me. Wild-eyed, covered in scratches, you can imagine the story I threw at them. Back at the ranger station, the police weren't fully buying it. Small-town cops always seemed skeptical of outsiders. The bodies they did find, couple, axe wounds, looked too clean-cut, no sign of some unhinged mountain man lurking about. The old trap thing just got tossed. The RV was empty, no Ezra. That was the worst part. They looked at me, some unspoken doubt in their eyes. Never went back for what they couldn't find. And never saw his face, just that shadowed outline beneath a faded ball cap. Some nights, I think I might have just dreamt it. Then the phantom ache settles into my shoulder where his grip dug in, and I know damn well it was real. The others got graves at least. Ezra? Out there somewhere, maybe the ground swallowed his bones for good. And somewhere amongst those trees, that madman is living off whatever sick rituals he's built in the silence. Sometimes, a little adventure is way more than you bargained for. Or survived. It was probably about, what, maybe two years ago that it happened. More? Look, time gets kinda weird when that kinda thing scars you for life. Anyway, my sister had just moved to Colorado, out in that tiny town with more elk than people, tucked right below the Rocky Mountains. Always swore up and down that the fresh air did her good, and her photos did back up how pretty the scenery was. I'm a city person myself, call me Declan, by the way, but a visit sounded just relaxing enough after months of dealing with a nasty divorce. You can get some real good wine out there, apparently. Turns out, you can also get yourself into a whole heap of trouble. My sister convinced me we just had to do a little hike up one of the trails right behind her house. Figured I'd humor her, get some steps in for my Fitbit, get myself that glass of fancy vino as a reward. She swore blind it was the easiest trail out there, nothing a flatlander like me couldn't handle. Maybe we got off on a detour without realizing. Maybe those trail maps really suck. Point is, what was meant to be an hour-long loop turned into something worse. Way worse. We got deep into those pine forests. That's a whole different kind of wilderness than I'm used to. Thick and tangled, sunlight struggling to reach the ground. Then, up ahead, we both spotted it at the same time just stopped us dead in our tracks. You're probably expecting me to say mountain lion or black bear, both very good reasons to turn tail and run, but nope. This wasn't an animal. Not the way anyone from Colorado would recognize it. It was something, humanoid. Big, I can't stress that enough, probably eight feet or more. But hunched over, like those shoulders couldn't handle its own weight. It had this pelt of dark brown fur, almost matted looking in some places, barely revealing the thick skin underneath. My eyes latched onto those hands, which were nothing like a human's. Long, thick fingers ending in claws more suited for digging than anything else. But even that wasn't the worst part. The face. Christ, the face. Flat, almost deformed looking, with deep set eyes that looked as empty as marbles and a nose so squashed it barely formed bumps. And its mouth. I ain't gonna lie, that gave me nightmares. Open wide, just dripping with spit, showing off rows of yellowed teeth more like fangs than anything a primate should have. Sister took off on instinct. 
No screaming, just smart thinking. I couldn't find my voice to yell her name when that, that damn thing turned its head and looked right at me with those beady eyes. Something snapped in me then. Fight or flight, all that primal stuff, but I ain't got the instincts for either. It wasn't that the thing looked strong, though God knows it did. Something just told me if it really wanted to hurt me, it would have already done the job. See, there was an unnatural way it lumbered forward, with this weird limp that had more than just injury in it. It made this low sound in its throat, almost whimpering, and that's the weird part that stuck with me all this time. It sounded curious. Not hungry, not angry. No, curious like a stray dog when you drop a piece of your sandwich. I wasn't sure what this meant, but somehow that bought me enough time to think. Remember, sister ran off, probably getting ahead and hoping this thing followed her scent instead. Now I ain't brave, but that's some sisterly loyalty I couldn't stomach the thought of failing on. Not after how messed up the divorce had been. I dug into my backpack. Wasn't carrying fancy mountain gear, but always bring a snack or two when dealing with my sister's health kicks. Tore open that bag of dried apricots I'd been meaning to finish and held them out toward it. Didn't get too close, mind you, but close enough it could at least see what I was holding. Now you're expecting something dramatic, right? Some growl or a roar, nothing. The creature stared stared with an intensity that would have been creepy in an animal, but took on this whole other quality given everything else. It shuffled forward a step. One claw dug into the dirt, like it had to balance and focus to stay upright. That whimpering noise turned into this pathetic rasp that made the hair on my neck stand on end. You might laugh but it sounded like the whimper I remember the neighbor's dog giving when it was half-starved. Then came the worst part that lurched forward, that oversized hand outstretched as it took another step and snatched the apricots out of my hand. Not like a bear snatches, where there's this clear aggression in the motion. Just this clumsy grab that barely brushed against my fingers before pulling away. My brain had barely caught up before the apricots were jammed into that toothy maw and swallowed whole, without barely a chew. That's when the sister yelled. Loud, piercing panic-filled yelling, drawing my attention away from the creature for half a second. But, but she ain't running for her life. She's a good ways off, waving me down frantically, eyes just bulging in terror. What could she see? and that's when I looked around and realized. I got so focused on this one creature, I hadn't seen the others. Another three figures emerging from the tree line, just as large, just as deformed. Same whimpering sounds drifting between them, that look of empty curiosity in their inhuman eyes. That's what got me moving. No heroic moment, no sudden bursts of strength. Just my sister yelling at me to run, and those four figures taking an unsettling step closer. It's weird the details you remember about something like that. The crunch of twigs under my boots. The sudden burst of energy after sitting frozen for so long. I don't know who got to her first, me or them. Doesn't matter. Got back to the house, got locked in, called the cops. All without another sighting. They searched, did those, standard procedures. Found no trace of wild animal attack, no missing or injured hikers reported. No footprints matching mine and my sister's story. The one thing they did keep harping on, how did nobody else see four damn bears walking loose up there? They didn't believe a word I told them. They didn't know about how close those claws got to my face. Didn't know the sound of them ripping open that fruit, like it was the first fresh food they'd eaten in months. The way their eyes tracked every motion. Or the chilling, empty realization that whatever those things were, they weren't bears. They weren't natural. 
I've heard folks use phrases like Sasquatch or Bigfoot, but there was something deeper and darker and honestly hungrier in the things I saw out there. The kind of wrong hunger that doesn't go away with a handful of dried apricots. So no, I'm never taking another damn hike again. City's got enough unnatural creatures already, just of the two-legged sort. Those, at least, I know my way around. A few years back, I did one of those solo motorcycle trips, California's Pacific Coast Highway the whole way up to Seattle. Guy like me needs to take time to clear his head and all that. I work as a freelance photographer, mostly weddings and corporate gigs. Pays fine, but it isn't exactly fulfilling. My name's Rowan, by the way. Anyway, with the trip I figured I'd get some stunning landscape shots while working out some things about where life was headed. There's a stretch of Highway 1 through Northern California's Redwood Country that twists right on the coast. One morning, after staying the night in a small town, I got breakfast from a roadside diner. Wasn't your typical tourist spot, and definitely felt like, locals only, territory. Everyone knew each other, waitress didn't offer me a menu, that whole deal. I ate by the window sipping coffee, figuring out my route for the day. Just outside the diner there was a trail that headed through the trees and down toward the sea. Something about it called to me. See, photography isn't just a click. You need to have an eye for something unique. So, I slung my camera bag over my shoulder, paid up, and headed down that trail. The trail wound deeper into the woods. No sounds of the highway anymore, just that redwood forest silence. And the way the light filtered through the canopy, well, that was the magic I was after. I could tell the trail would eventually hit the coastline, probably with a scenic overlook or something. Maybe there'd be crashing waves for dramatic framing, even some wildlife. Everything was falling into place creatively. Then, up ahead... The trees broke and I spotted a faint trail through some dunes towards the beach. No tourists in sight, just sand and windblown grass. Bingo. I picked my way down the dunes and stepped onto the hard-packed sand. No other footprints. Maybe that should have been my first signal to turn back. But there were titipools up ahead, dark gray rocks jutting from the sea mist. Figured that would make a decent photo to break up the monotony of the ocean horizon. While getting closer to the rock formations, I noticed two people standing out amongst them. Their silhouettes were blurred by the sea haze. At first, I figured they must be checking for titipools like me, maybe looking for crabs or something. I started towards them. Maybe getting an action shot of them would be an improvement on static rocks got closer, and noticed something wasn't right. These folks couldn't decide if they wanted to wade or stay dry. One minute and they were knee-deep in the surf, the next they were back further along the shore. Worse, their clothes seemed off, old-fashioned and drapey, not practical at all for a chilly beach day. Then one of them looked my direction, that's when everything went to hell. Not quite sure how to explain it. The thing seemed to crouch, but wrong, like its bones didn't fit together right. The head turned at an impossible angle, and I froze to the spot. No eyes, just blankness. But it knew I was there. My skin felt wrong, like sandpaper brushing against me. They started loping in my direction. It was almost comical at first, their gait so off-balance, jerky. It felt more like a puppet show than real motion. There was something in the sand below them, trails like dragging limbs. That's when panic finally kicked my brain into gear. I whirled and ran back up toward the dunes, 
barely glancing behind me. But I already knew they were getting closer fast. They didn't even try to hide the unnatural way they moved now. I didn't bother with the trail through the trees. Just tore up through the underbrush, branches slicing against my face, thorns shredding my camera bag. I heard a sort of barking behind me, but didn't dare look. Then, just as I broke into a clearing with the diner within sight, I heard someone cry out. An older man, maybe on an afternoon stroll. They'd gotten him. There wasn't anything I could do but keep running. When I burst into the diner, people turned to stare. Banged on the glass, they probably thought I was some homeless vagrant with my ripped clothes and bleeding scratches. Took forever for anyone to let me in. Stammered something out about. Attack, beach, shapes. To the crowd. Some folks looked worried, but the cops showed up before I could explain more. That's when I started crying and laughing all at once, I think. They searched the woods, of course, found no sign of what I saw. That old man who was attacked, they put it down to an animal, maybe a stray with rabies. Me? Nobody believed me. Maybe they figured I was hopped up on something. I ended up leaving California the next day. Never touched my camera for months. Still hear that ragged yapping in my nightmares. That beach felt tainted somehow. Even now, I look at those coastal road photos I did manage to take, and I wonder if anyone looks back at me through the trees. Did those things even show up in my pictures? Never again, though. The coast isn't safe. They might still be out there waiting. I learned about skinwalkers later online. The only explanation that makes sense. Several years ago, I went on a hike through the backcountry of Yosemite National Park. Asterisk, asterisk, I'd been working long hours behind a desk for months at that time, so I craved something remote, something that would challenge me. Yosemite called to me with its soaring granite walls and deep forests. It was just the kind of place where I could reconnect with a more primal part of myself. I'm Jared, by the way. I was in my early thirties then, fit and active. I meticulously packed for a four-day solo expedition. The forecast was clear. I couldn't have asked for better conditions. On the first morning... I felt an exhilarating feeling of freedom as I set off down the trail, my pack heavy on my shoulders. Those initial miles passed in a happy blend of adrenaline and awe. Yosemite truly had a majestic touch. The trail itself wasn't overly strenuous, well maintained by the park rangers. Each bend offered new, incredible views. I remember, when I came upon the clearing that day, something shifted. No dramatic scenery change, just a subtle tension settling into the air. I paused, listening to the birdsong, trying to identify what felt off. I couldn't pin it down, so I shrugged it off. Sometimes, alone in the wild, your imagination wanders. Later that afternoon, the clearing came back into view. There it was again, the odd unease. Before, that prickling sense at the back of my neck could be explained away. Now, it demanded my attention. Stepping off the trail, I approached a cluster of tall pines just on the edge of the open space. That's when I saw it. I don't know how long I stood frozen in a combination of surprise and sheer disbelief. There, dangling from a gnarled branch maybe ten feet up, on the deer carcass. Fresh. But most importantly, the way it was suspended, with its body cavity torn open, emptied, gave me chills. The precision of the cuts, the unnatural emptiness, this wasn't the work of some mountain lion or hungry bear. This was calculated. 
intentional. Instinct screamed at me, move, with shaking hands, I snapped a few unsteady pictures and retreated to the path. Looking over my shoulder, I had this horrible feeling I was being watched. Picking up my pace, I didn't stop until long after the sun had dipped behind the cliffs. Exhausted, my mind swirling, I made camp as quickly as I could. Sleep didn't come easily that night. In the harsh light of morning, it was tempting to dismiss the hanging animal as a grisly quirk. Hadn't I already told myself my imagination was running wild? Something told me that would be a foolish mistake. That gutted deer, it spoke to some other level of danger. I packed up, skipped breakfast, and hit the trail determined to put whatever that incident was behind me. I even laughed at myself after a few hours, feeling silly for getting spooked. Then, later that day, I found another. Similar, the same careful butchery, except this time it looked like a coyote. This was no freak occurrence. My heart rate spiked. Something, or someone, was out here, meticulously dissecting kills and hanging them in what seemed like a perverse display. Who would do that? A poacher? No, this felt beyond hunting. More like some unsettling ritual. By now, the primal fear centers of my brain were screaming the same word, predator. Whatever or whoever I was dealing with, I was being tracked. Every shadow, every rustle of leaves, a threat. Panic nibbled at the edge of my consciousness, threatening to take control. I'd seen enough nature documentaries to know how this might play out. I was cornered, miles from the nearest ranger station or other living soul. That's when I made a crucial, maybe impulsive, decision. There was a shortcut leading back to the park's main road. It was longer, less well-traveled. But my gut shouted that isolation was the most dangerous thing right now. Pushing myself into a grueling pace, I veered onto the overgrown side trail. It wound through a shadowy valley, dense with towering pines. Darkness descended quickly here. This was a mistake. In the fading light, my eyes played tricks on me, catching movement just outside my vision. Was that a shape behind that boulder? Did that branch just shift on its own? Then I heard it. Not a howl, not a roar. A chilling, high-pitched cry that felt human, yet undeniably animal. Terror ripped through me. Adrenaline surging, I took off running, dodging through trees, barely seeing the faint trail underfoot. My heart slammed against my ribs, a ragged counterpoint to the pounding of my feet. Something moved ahead, breaking the flow of the undergrowth. Not an animal, I realized with a flash of dread, but a shape, unmistakably bipedal. Tall, unnaturally long limbs. It seemed to pause mid-stride as if catching my scent, turning just slightly. Just enough for me to catch a glimpse of a face, gaunt, stretched skin, and the terrifying flash of eyes glowing in the gloom. That's when I slipped in the loose pine needles. One second I was fleeing, the next I was sprawling forward, branches lashing against my skin. Panic turned to despair as I struggled to stand, gasping for breath. In my blind fear, I'd fallen within spitting distance of that. Asterisk thing star. It advanced, and time slowed to a sickening crawl. It came on four legs now, dropping with an impossible fluidity down on all fours. My vision narrowed, focused on details too monstrous to comprehend. Claws that tore into the forest floor. Skin stretched unnaturally taut over bone. Teeth too numerous, too sharp. Just as it sprang in with its mouth impossibly wide, instinct seized me. In a stroke of luck, I twisted into a desperate roll. Claws raked over my side, a hot burning pain against my ribs. 
something wet splattered on my skin. That close. If I hadn't rolled. Ignoring the pain, I staggered upwards, scrambling forward through the darkness. I heard it land heavily behind me, its strange screech rising again. Each gasping breath tasted like metallic terror. Somehow I burst out of that wooded nightmare and onto a road. Exhausted and bleeding, I flagged down the first passing truck, shouting something wild about a creature in the woods. The kindly older couple brought me to safety, got me cleaned up at a local hospital. The police eventually took a statement, but found nothing during their search of the wilderness. And, of course, they didn't believe me. I told them what I saw, or believed I saw. Shock, they said. A mountain lion, bear maybe. My photos of the gutted animals provided no leads. As soon as I healed enough, I got out of there as fast as I could. Didn't want to hear any campfire stories or local folklore. The less of that, the better. My story never made the news. It was one of thousands of unexplained wilderness encounters, brushed aside, written off as the rambling of a traumatized hiker. Yet, even now, years later, I know better. There are things out there in the dark places, monstrous things that defy every rational explanation. I searched for answers for a long time, and in the process stumbled onto Native American mythology, tales of shape-shifting entities, starved abominations from a time before man. Skinwalkers, they call them. Could that have been what I encountered? I'll never know for sure. Sometimes, on nights when the wind cuts through the walls of my apartment just right, I think I hear that inhuman screech echoing out in the distance. A few decades past, maybe more, can't recall. I still get nightmares about it. I was a different guy then. My name is Eamon. People call me Eam, though. I hunted back then. Spent a lot of time in the swamps. The Everglades are like a second home, full of life, beautiful and dangerous. Perfect spot to catch a big gator, if you're into that. I never saw one of those creatures before that day. Never wanted to, either. There's always stories out there about gators bigger than a truck or some monster lurking out in the sawgrass. But you just laugh it off as the usual tall tales hunters tell over beers. See, I don't believe in the supernatural. Or I didn't anyway. I like things grounded in reality, things you can explain with logic. That morning started like any other trip. Up before dawn, double-checking my gear— grabbing a coffee too strong for any civilized human. The air was thick with bugs and the smell of brackish water. I waded out into the swamp, the mud squelching under my boots. This spot, about an hour out from any known trail, was my favorite. No tourists stumbling through, no other hunters vying for the good catches. Funny, the thing I remember most about that day wasn't some spooky feeling or a sense of dread. It was the damn alligator I almost stepped on. The thing blended in perfectly with a clump of reeds. Scared the hell out of me when it hissed, showing me those needle-like teeth. That should have been my sign to turn back right there. Instead, I settled against the cypress, the twisted roots making a decent seat. Hours passed, the usual swamp symphony of bugs and birds lulling me into that relaxed hunter's trance. I got a bite, but not my target. Some oversized gar pulled up my bait, fought with that thrashing, prehistoric stubbornness they're known for. It snapped my line and vanished, and I wasn't even mad. Some days are all about the quiet, the solitude. Then the smell hit. Not that usual swamp rot, though that's never pleasant. This was different. Musky, 
but cloying and somehow wrong. I sniffed the air, trying to pinpoint the source. Animals have a distinct fear smell, but this wasn't that. It was just off. The birds went silent with eerie suddenness, and that's what made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I got to my feet, rifle clutched tight, the hunter becoming the hunted. I scanned the tangle of mangroves, heart pounding faster than it should for an old swamp rat like me. It came from behind. A guttural snarl that sent ice into my veins. I whirled rifle raised, but it moved too damn fast. A blur of motion, and then something huge slammed into me, knocking the wind right out of me. I hit the water, hard, the rifle flying from my grasp. I floundered, trying to gain my footing, my mind scrambling for what the hell just attacked me. I never got a good look at it the first time, just a flash of dark muscle and bone-jarring impact. I scrambled to the shore, pure adrenaline driving me, my heart a frantic drum in my ears. It didn't follow, but I could hear it circling, its breathing a harsh, ragged thing in the stillness. That's when I saw the blood. Not mine, too much of it. Dripping from the bushes, spattering the leaves. My eyes followed the trail, and that's when I found what it was dragging. The thing was grotesque. Twisted and wrong, like something out of a nightmare. It was the size of a man, or larger, but hunched over, limbs too long and ending in vicious claws. The skin hung loose, hairless and leathery gray. What chilled me most was the head. Too narrow, a flat, sloping skull with eyes that blazed pure yellow, like a predator reflecting my flashlight at night. And clutched in its teeth was the body of a damn alligator. The one I'd nearly tripped over, mangled and ripped open like a ragdoll. Fear turned cold. Gators are tough, mean bastards. Whatever this was, it wasn't something that belonged here, something the ecosystem could explain. I had to get out. Every instinct screamed at me to run. But damn it, I was no coward. I crept to where I'd lost my rifle, cringing against the rustle of every leaf under my boots. The creature stalked me. I could hear its raspy panting, smell its foul, sickly sweet scent filling the air. The rifle lay in the mud, thankfully undamaged. I hefted it, flicked off the safety, and fought down the shakes that threatened to wreck my aim. I waited, not daring to turn my back on the trees. Waited for it to make its move. When it did, it came from my blind spot, leaping from the tangle of branches with impossible speed. I fired one, two, three times. The impact slammed it back, and it shrieked, a sound that made my skin crawl. Then it hit the ground and bolted, vanishing into the undergrowth like it was never there. I stood frozen for a long time, heart pounding, ears ringing. The stink of copper from the discharged rounds mingled with the musk of the creature. Part of me, the stupid, stubborn part, wanted to track it, to put the damned thing down. But the smarter, very scared part urged me the other way. I didn't go back there. Called a park ranger, spun some story about an aggressive gator, claimed I'd scared it off. He didn't buy it, I could see it in his eyes, but he didn't find any trace of what I'd described. I didn't blame him. I'd write it off as a hallucination myself, if it wasn't for the nightmares, and the scar on my chest where its claws had raked me. People say the Everglades are full of mystery, of hidden things. They aren't wrong. There are creatures out there the science books don't explain. Maybe that's why the local tribes tell tales about the swamp monster, the skunk ape. Maybe those tales are rooted in more truth than we want to admit.
Years went by, hell, maybe a decade, before I could stomach setting foot back in the Everglades. Some scars aren't just on the skin. I'm Callan, by the way. People call me Cal, though. I used to be a fishing guide, one of the good ones, helping tourists snag those giant bass and bragging about it over overpriced beers. Life in the swamp was simple, peaceful in its own way. Now, I drive a truck, haul groceries, not gators. The stink of fish oil still makes my stomach churn. A bad day hauling pallets is still better than a good day out there with that thing lurking in the shadows. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It was a routine trip. The tourists were out in force. A retired couple from Wisconsin, all matching khaki and fanny packs. Nice folks. But the type who'd squeal at a mosquito bite and send me scrambling over roots to play wilderness rescue. Not that I could blame them. The Everglades hold more than just fish and pretty birds. We were way out in Shark River Slough, the mangroves thick enough to block out the sun. That's prime gator territory, which can make for tense tourists. I'd spotted one earlier, a big male sunning himself. Even those city folk had the good sense to keep their distance. Things went wrong around midday. The guy... Ronald, if I remember right, got his lure snagged on a half-submerged tree. He started yanking, then swearing, and I braced for the inevitable snap of the line that would send a lure whizzing past my head. Only it didn't snap. Instead, there was a sickening, fleshy-tearing sound followed by an ungodly splash. We all poked our heads over the side of the boat. I figured the lure had caught a submerged gator, probably ticked it off right good. But the thrashing in the murky water, it was too big, too violent, even for a pissed-off reptile. I started the engine, thinking we needed to get out of there quickly. That's when it rose. Not a gator, no way. It reared from the water, a good eight feet tall at least, hunched and dripping. I froze. The image burned into my memory. Scaly, yes, but a sickly, pale yellow. The head was small for its size, skull tapered with flat, black eyes. But the claws. Jesus, those claws were like rusted hooks, long and dripping blood. It grabbed what was left of its prey, something already half-shredded. I couldn't identify it in that mess but from the size, it could have been a decent-sized gator itself. The thing vanished back under the water with its meal, leaving crimson swirls and the terrified screams of Mrs. Wisconsin in its wake. By the time the park rangers arrived, guided by a trembling Ronald and his now-sobbing wife, there was nothing left but some blood in the water and their half-crazed story. They looked at me like I was in on it, some elaborate prank on tourists at best, or covering up some illegal hunting operation at worst. Hell, part of me wished either was true. I was suspended from guiding after that, the board citing safety concerns. I didn't fight it. Truth is, I wanted to be far away from those murky depths. The nightmares hit me soon after, though. Jolting awake, heart pounding, smelling that damp, rotten scent, and hearing those claws clicking on floorboards that weren't there. The story got around, naturally. Became some local legend twisted out of shape. Some old-timers claimed I'd seen the skunk ape, the cryptid that supposedly haunts the swamps. I scoffed at them, until I started doing my own research. There's tales in old Seminole lore about a swamp monster a scaled thing, a flesh-eater, not an ape, but with the same stink of fear around it. Did I really see that? I don't know for sure. Part of me still tries to rationalize a mutant of some sort, escaped exotic pet, a trick of the swamp light. But I'll never forget the look in those black, lifeless eyes. Some things hide in the shadows, things the science books can't, or won't, explain. And every once in a while, 
when the stink of low tide hits my nostrils or shadows flicker in just the wrong way across my bedroom wall, I remember that I'm damn lucky to be alive. The thing is, it didn't end there. Not really. News travels fast in small towns, and my story reached ears it wasn't meant for. A few months after losing my guide license, I got approached by this guy. Slick suit, the kind that screams city slicker, and a smile like a barracuda. He spoke fast, smooth, offered me a lot of cash for a little favor. He was part of a group, see, wildlife enthusiasts, he called them, cryptozoologists, or monster hunters if you don't want to use the fancy term, and they wanted to find my creature, offered me as a guide, promised there'd be protection, armed men with high-tech gadgets. They were convinced they could catch it, study it, prove its existence to the world. I told them to shove their money and their science jargon where the sun doesn't shine. But that glint in their eyes, it was more than just the thrill of the hunt. If they found it, what then? Lab experiments, a cage in some billionaire's private zoo? Hell, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe the thing should have been hunted down, neutralized. But my gut churned at the thought of those guys out there with guns and a hunger for the unknown. The Everglades have their secrets for a reason. And some secrets, some creatures, they're better left undisturbed. So instead I left town. Moved north, changed my name, started driving my truck. The nightmares still wake me sometimes, and the image of that creature tearing into its prey still haunts my dreams. Sometimes I'll catch a whiff of something foul from a storm drain, or spot the too quick gleam of an eye in the shadows. And then, I'll find myself at the nearest truck stop, buying a map and some lousy coffee, tracing a line southwards to the place I swore I'd never return. The Everglades have a way of pulling you back, I get that now. But I'm not going to track that thing down, not going to hunt it. Hell, maybe I should be warning folks away, telling my story at bars or posting it online. But that feels like tempting fate, like calling that creature's attention. Instead, I just drive the long, empty highways, telling myself that as long as I keep moving, I'll be one step ahead. Because out there, lurking beneath the calm surface of those waters, something waits. Something that remembers me. This happened to me on September 16, 1999. Been a search and rescue officer for Olympic National Forest going on two decades now. These woods, they're my backyard. Or I thought they were. Name's Jack Riley, and after that night, I don't take them for granted anymore, not one bit. Routine call came in. Two hikers, a young couple named Sarah and Ben hadn't checked back in from an overnight trip. Popular trail, well used, but hey, things happen. People get turned around, especially late season when the weather can shift as quick as a blink. Me and my rookie partner, kid named Daniel, loaded up and headed out late afternoon. Kid was fresh out of the academy, eager to prove himself, reminded me of myself back when I started. We find their car still parked at the trailhead. It's starting to drizzle a bit, typical for this rainforest, and fogs rolling in thick off the coast. I figure that's the likely culprit anyway. Maybe they decided to camp off trail, got lost in the mist. Daniel jokes nervously about the place having spooky vibes, something out of those twilight movies his girlfriend loves. I tell him to focus and we head in, the air heavy with the scent of rain and damp earth. The trail takes us alongside the whole river for a stretch, fast-flowing water churning with a hypnotic rhythm, then cuts deeper into the heart of the forest. Moss hangs like birds off the trees, 
and the undergrowth is so thick it blocks most of the fading sunlight. The damp chill seeps right through my jacket, and with the fog swirling around, visibility is down to just a few yards at times. Daniel comments on the silence no birds, no wind rustling the leaves, just the constant drip-drip of rain on the canopy above and our own footsteps on the muddy path. Then we find their campsite. Or what's left of it. The tent is shredded to ribbons, clothes and supplies scattered everywhere. There's blood, a lot of it, sprayed across the ground and dripping off the surrounding ferns. At that point, I'm radioing for backup, my voice thick with dread. Daniel practically throws up. I tell him to man the radio, stay sharp, and I start searching, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. I find the first body, or rather half of it, a few hundred yards from the campsite. It's Sarah, and the wounds, well, they're like nothing I've ever seen outside of a butcher shop nightmare. Animal attack, sure, but bigger and more brutal than any bear or cougar I've ever heard of. Claws like razors, bites that tore through flesh and bone. I call for Daniel, but get no reply. My stomach sinks, the radio static suddenly roaring in my ears. That's when I see the other body, Daniel, or what's left of him, hanging from a branch some fifteen feet above me. His eyes stare out, empty and wide, and for a second, I swear I see movement in the shadows above him, a hulking shape slipping away. I raise my rifle, hand trembling, and scan the branches. Nothing visible. I take a hesitant step forward, and hear the snap of a twig behind me. My blood runs cold. I whirl around, catching just a flash of something enormous disappearing into the undergrowth, a flash of matted dark fur, of eyes glowing with a menacing yellow, and a monstrous, misshapen jaw. My breath catches in my throat, and I instinctively take a shot at the retreating shadow. It roars, an inhuman screech that sends a flock of unseen birds scattering. I spend the next several hours searching for whatever did this. Backup arrives, rangers, wildlife folks, even a tracker from one of the local Quillute tribes. There's a lot of speculation, of hushed voices and sideways glances. Cougar? Maybe a pack of them gone feral? The tracker shakes his head, his face grim. He doesn't recognize the claw marks, whispers something about the old stories, legends of a creature his people call the Sasquatchilu, a vengeful spirit, a protector of the forest. Whatever it was, it left no clear trail for us to follow, just lingering dread and a sense of eyes watching from the shadows. Then, as darkness starts to fall, we hear it. A piercing shriek that echoes through the trees, seeming to come from everywhere at once. Above us, we catch a flash of something big and dark moving with unsettling speed through the foliage. I raise my rifle and fire off a few shots, more of a reflexive warning than anything else. It lets out another inhuman screech, then disappears into the depths of the forest. It stalks us all night, its unearthly howls and the sound of snapping branches circling us like a predator with its prey. We huddle together on a ridge under the thick canopy, huddled around a small fire. The expert tracker whispers more stories, tales of hikers who vanished without a trace. By the time dawn finally breaks, we're all jumpy wrecks, seeing shadows in every corner. There's something almost relieved on the faces of even the most seasoned officers as we turn our backs on that accursed patch of forest. We make it back to the trailhead just as a search helicopter buzzes overhead, our search a failure. The official explanation is an animal attack unsolved. They never find any trace of that monster. I haven't been back into that part of the forest since, though I sometimes feel its eyes on me from the depths of the trees, like it knows I got away. 
Maybe the locals were right. Maybe there are things we're better off not understanding, things that lurk in the deepest shadows. I just know what I saw, what saw me back, and that's enough to haunt my nightmares forever. This happened to me on July 4, 2006. Name's Mike Holden. I've been a search and rescue officer in Yosemite National Park longer than most folks stick with anything these days. Married two kids, a dog, a mortgage. You know, a normal guy. Well, as normal as anyone gets after facing down the things I've faced in these woods. A missing persons call came in late afternoon. A pair of experienced hikers, man and woman, failed to check back in from a planned multi-day trek on a remote trail in the park's backcountry. Routine procedure. Gear up, radio the rangers, grab my partner and, and set out. Even with the holiday crowds in the valley, I figured we'd find them holed up with twisted ankles by morning, cursing their bad luck and swearing off the wilderness for good. The trail wound deeper into the ancient forest, the cheerful tourist chatter dropping away with every mile. Yosemite is big, awe-inspiring, the kind of place that makes you feel small. That day, though, it felt different. Oppressive, even. The air felt heavy, thick with the scent of pine needles and damp earth, but no birdsong, no insects buzzing just the thick silence that settled in my bones, and looked nervous, glancing at the dense trees as if they hid some unseen threat. I reassured her, mostly for my own benefit. We hit the spot where the hikers should have set up their last camp. Their tent was torn down, ransacked. Supplies were strewn everywhere, food wrappers scattered like confetti. We both saw the smeared bloodstains on a rock, and the feeling in my gut turned to ice. I radioed it in, my voice steady with a professionalism drilled into me through years on the job, and looked pale. She was fresh out of training, this was her first real case. I sent her back down the trail to secure the area. Didn't want her seeing what I suspected we might find. I found the man first. What was left of him, rather. I won't go into the grisly details. Let's just say, it wasn't an accident. Bear, cougar, you name it, I'd seen the aftermath of nature's brutal side, and this was something else entirely. The sheer violence of it, the wounds, they sent a chill through me even after all my time on the job. It was calculated, driven by a viciousness that seemed almost angry. I heard a noise behind me, a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Whirled around, rifle raised, and that's when I saw it. Crouched in the shadows under a mass of redwood, the biggest damn thing I've witnessed to this day. A hulking figure, standing easily seven feet on powerful hind legs. Its body was covered in dense, dark fur corded with muscles that rippled with its every breath. And its eyes, those eyes glowed a chilling amber in the dim light, filled with a chilling mix of animal instinct and cunning intelligence. Before I could process what I was seeing, it charged with a speed that defied its size. Its roar tore from its throat, a mix of animal shriek and something far more disturbing, a sound that echoed in my bones. I fired off a shot, more out of shock than any real hope of stopping it. Roaring in pain, it momentarily recoiled. I took the chance and ran, stumbling through the trees, crashing through foliage. The creature's furious bellows echoed through the forest behind me, each one driving me harder. I must have tripped, blacking out for a moment. When I came to... I was tangled in a thicket of thorny bushes, a sharp pain throbbing in my leg. Above me, the creature was sniffing the air, its breath coming in ragged gasps. It circled, 
its frustration radiating through the silent forest. With a supreme effort, I stayed hidden while it stalked off, confused by my sudden disappearance. Its footsteps faded further into the woods, leaving a terrified silence in their wake. By the time an and backup found me, I was a shivering mess, barely holding it together. I told them about the man, about the blood, and finally, faltering, I described what attacked us. Their faces went from concern to skeptical, like they were sizing me up as a trauma case. Official report put it down to an animal attack, the hiker's deaths unsolved. Nobody but and believed me about what I swore I saw. I don't blame them. It sounds like the stuff of nightmares, a monster from campfire tales. But they called an enemy heroes that day for finding the surviving hiker, the woman. She never spoke of what attacked them. Her eyes haunted. Trauma can do funny things to the mind. I haven't gone into that area since. Most folks think I'm avoiding the bad memories. And yeah, those are burned into my brain for good. But mostly, it's that feeling of being watched, of sensing something moving in the shadows just beyond my sight. The knowledge that something lurks out there, something old and powerful and very, very angry. The locals tell stories, passed down from the tribes who knew these lands long before us. Tales of the Wendigo, the forest spirit, driven by an ancient hunger, a vengeful creature forever on the hunt. I don't know if I believe in those stories, exactly. But I know what I saw, and more importantly, I know it saw me too. And some nights, when the wind whispers through the trees, I still swear I can feel its eyes on me, waiting. July 9th, 1991 Always wanted a piece of land to call my own. Got tired of the rat race, being just another cog in the machine. After getting out of the army, I found a secluded plot in the vast Montana wilderness, built myself a cabin, figured I could finally live life on my terms. Name's Walker. First few years were a simple kind of paradise. Hunted, fished, chopped wood, felt a peace I'd never known in the city. Then folks started going missing. A hiker who strayed off trail, a couple of hunters who never came back to their truck. Some whispered about grizzlies, others blamed packs of wolves getting aggressive. Me, I wasn't so sure. There was something off about those disappearances, a wrongness that prickled the hair on the back of my neck. Then I found Harper. He had a cabin a few miles over, grizzled old mountain man type, kept mostly to himself. Found his place ransacked, Blood smeared all over the walls and half-eaten, remains scattered around the clearing. Whatever did that wasn't any animal I recognized. Harper was tough as nails, knew how to handle himself in those woods. Yet something tore him to pieces. That's when the fear set in. I fortified my cabin, reinforced the doors and windows, kept my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. The woods seemed to hold their breath, a thick silence settling over everything. I'd swear I heard footsteps circling the cabin, the guttural rasp of breathing, the scratch of claws against the walls. Couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched, hunted. Caught a glimpse of it a few weeks later, while out scouting for deer. It was hunched near the creek, a hulking form silhouetted against the twilight. Stood upright on two legs, easily eight feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur. Its face. God, that face was stretched and twisted into a parody of a wolf, its mouth full of long, jagged teeth. But those eyes, they burned with a chilling, hungry intelligence. I stumbled back, dropping my pack, terror sending my heart pounding against my ribs. 
I heard it rise to its full height behind me, a snarl echoing through the dense trees. I didn't stop running until I reached my cabin, collapsing inside and slamming the door shut. Four days it besieged me. Pounded on the walls, tore at my roof, its ragged breathing a constant, maddening torment. I barely ate, jumping at every shadow, the image of Harper's remains and the creature's blazing eyes seared into my mind. I started talking to myself, trying to drown out the scratching and guttural snarls that seemed to come from all sides. One morning, the sounds simply stopped. I waited for hours, a loaded rifle clutched in my trembling hands, but nothing came. Cautiously, I crept outside. The ground around the cabin was trampled and gouged, and a sickening, rotten stench hung heavy in the air. The creature was gone, but the terror remained. I knew it would be back. I couldn't stay. Threw what I could carry into my truck and drove. Didn't stop until I hit the sprawling outskirts of some faceless city. Found a cramped, grimy apartment where the lights never go out and the hum of traffic masked the silence that used to fill me with dread. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I think I still hear the rasp of its breath on the other side of the thin wall. I imagine its burning eyes fixed on my window, smell that rotting musk taint the city air. I sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow and jump at every creek in the old building. Montana, the woods, that simple life I yearn for. All seem like a distant dream now, tainted with the memory of those glowing eyes and Harper's gruesome end. Folks in those parts have stories, whispers of a creature called the Wendigo, a ravenous spirit from the old legends. I don't know what to believe anymore. Only that out there, in the vast, untamed wild, something inhuman walks the lonely places. And some of us, fools that we are, stumble into its path. June 6, 2009 I was tired of playing society's games, tired of the constant hustle, just to earn enough to pay rent and bills. Ex-military, and the quiet life had started to call to me. Found myself a plot of land nestled in the remote Appalachian Mountains, built a small cabin to call my own. Names Everett. First couple of years were bliss. Learned to live off the land, hunted deer, grew my own vegetables, chopped firewood to ward off the winter chill. The woods, they felt safe then, welcoming. Then people from the nearest town started going missing. A couple of drunken teenagers got lost and never turned up. Then old man Carmichael vanished while out checking his hunting traps. Search parties combed the woods but came back empty-handed. Folks whispered about wild hogs getting bold, or moonshiners getting protective of their stills. Me, I had an uneasy feeling, a sense that something unnatural was lurking out there, watching. Then I found Thompson's place. Thompson was another off-gridder, lived a good five-mile hike from my cabin. We weren't close, but we'd swap supplies occasionally share stories over a bottle of whiskey on cold nights. His cabin had been torn apart, like something huge and angry had ripped through it. Blood was splattered all over, and there were pieces of him strewn across the clearing. The sight turned my stomach. This was no bear attack, no wild animal gone rogue. I stumbled back to my cabin in a daze, the brutal image of the aftermath burned into my memory. Secured my doors, loaded my shotgun, and settled in for a sleepless night, the silence of the woods broken only by my own ragged breathing. It didn't come for me then, but I knew, deep down, that it was just a matter of time. Every snap of a twig sent me scrambling for my rifle. I slept in short bursts, Nightmares of gleaming eyes and ragged snarls jarring me awake. 
Then one night I saw it. Full moon painted the landscape in an eerie glow, and there it was, hunkered by the tree lean. It stood impossibly tall, eight feet at least, covered in coarse, dark fur. Its head was like a wolf's, only elongated, its muzzle twisted into a grotesque snarl that exposed rows of dagger-like teeth. Those eyes, they were the worst part, burning with yellow light and a chilling malevolence. We locked eyes, and I swear I felt the hunger radiating off it. I fired off a shot, but my trembling hands missed their mark. The creature snarled, a bone-rattling sound that cut through the night, and bolted off into the woods. From then on, the siege began. Every night it circled my cabin, scratching at the walls, leaving deep gouges in the wood. I became a prisoner in my own home, the relentless, guttural snarls and the stink of it, a mix of rotten flesh and something fouler, my constant companions. The psychological torture was almost worse than the threat of physical attack. One morning, it simply wasn't there anymore. No noises, no stench, only the chilling silence of the woods. I waited for days, terror churning in my gut, but it never came back. I took that as my cue to leave. Didn't pack much, just started walking, driven by a blind need to put as much distance between me and those woods as possible. Ended up in a grimy little town, took a job in construction, anything to keep me surrounded by noise and concrete, signs of civilization. Crowds make me uneasy now, bring back the feeling of being watched, hunted. I rent a tiny, nondescript apartment where the walls feel too close and the windows rattle in the wind. But it's better than the vast, empty silence of the woods. Sometimes, when the breeze carries a musky, rotten scent, I freeze, the image of those blazing yellow eyes flashing in my mind. I hear the crunch of its footsteps in every creak of the old building, taste that primal fear all over again. Maybe it'll track me down, even here. Maybe nowhere is far enough. Folks in the town whisper about the goat man, some kind of cryptid. I wonder if that's what I saw, or if it's something else, something even the old legends haven't given a name. The not knowing might just be the most terrifying part of all. This happened to me a couple years back, before I moved to the city. I was living in a small town tucked into the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Beautiful country, but kinda lonely. Me, I'm more into computers and video games than hanging out. My name's Ryland, by the way. But I did have one friend around there, Elijah. He was the outgoing type, always dragging me along on some adventure. One Saturday, he showed up at my door all excited. He'd read about this old, abandoned asylum out in the woods. Said it had a dark history, the usual stories about patients mistreated, maybe even some murders that they covered up. Perfect spooky weekend trip, according to him. Me, I thought it sounded dumb, maybe even dangerous. But he finally talked me into it. We took my old jeep out there, along some barely marked trails. The place had been empty for decades. Peeling paint, crumbling structure, that whole haunted vibe. Elijah was thrilled. I mostly wished I'd stayed home. We poked around the outside, found a busted window on the lower floor, and climbed inside. Even with daylight filtering in, the place was creepy. Long, echoing hallways, empty rooms that smelled old. You could almost imagine screams coming from those bare walls. We came across what must have been the common area. Huge vaulted ceiling, bits of broken furniture scattered around. Elijah insisted on exploring further, but I wanted out. That's when we heard the noise. 
a scratching sound coming from further in the building. I froze. Elijah, though, he got this gleam in his eye, like it only made things more interesting. He started edging towards the sound. I didn't want to be left alone, so I followed, heart pounding. It led us to a wing that looked even more rotten, holes in the floor, water damage everywhere. We reached a room at the end. No more scratching, but the silence felt worse. There was a smell. Musty and thick, almost metallic. Elijah took one step into the room, gasped. I saw it then. A huge shape hunched in the shadows. Way too big to be any animal I knew. It turned, and I saw a flash of yellow eyes before it let out a roar that shook the whole building. Elijah screamed. We both took off, back down the corridor. I heard the crashing of heavy paws behind us. Elijah tripped, stumbled right in front of me. The thing was on him in a second, a blur of claws and teeth. I just stood there, frozen, as it ripped into him. Screaming, gurgling, then it went quiet. Only the sound of the thing breathing and messy tearing sounds. I came back to my senses then. I turned and ran, back towards the window where we got in. Vaulted over it, landing hard on the other side. Didn't look back. Just ran for the jeep, fumbling with my keys. I drove like a maniac, back roads, main roads, didn't care. Ended up at the nearest police station, hysterical. Told them everything about the asylum, the creature, Elijah. They looked at me like I was cracked up. Searched the asylum, found nothing. No trace of my friend, no sign of what I described. Put it down to me either making it up, or some kind of drug-induced hallucination. But I know what happened out there. The cops, they don't believe in things they wouldn't understand. I started doing my own research then online. Obscure legends, stories about creatures out in the deep woods, half-man, half-wolf. Dogmen, some call them. Elijah's gone because of me. If I just stayed at home that day like I wanted. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine that thing is still out there, sniffing around the edge of town. I keep blinds drawn triple-check the locks on the doors. I always assumed there was nothing in the darkness to really be afraid of. Now, I'm not so sure. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Texas Hill Country. I'm a photographer, do a lot of nature work, so I'm used to being out in the woods alone. That area is all rugged, rolling hills covered in scrub oak, a few isolated ranches scattered around. My name's Wyatt, by the way. I was working on a project, trying to capture some of the local wildlife at night. Took a lot of patience. Set up my camera traps, then found this old... Abandoned shack out in the middle of nowhere to hunker down for a few days. Figured it was better than sleeping in my truck. First couple of nights went fine. Got some cool shots. A bobcat, a huge owl, the usual. Then, the third night, I woke up to scratching sounds. Assumed it was a raccoon sniffing around for scraps outside the shack. But then came a snarl and the scratching got louder right at the flimsy door. I grabbed my flashlight, shone it through the window. There it was. For a split second, I thought it was a huge dog rearing up at the door. But then I got a good look at it. It stood on its hind legs, easily as tall as a man, hunched over. Its fur was thick and dark, its head a snarling mess of fangs and gleaming yellow eyes. This wasn't any dog I'd ever seen. Something about it was wrong. I stumbled back, heart pounding. The thing slammed against the door, 
making the whole shack shake. I fumbled for my phone. No signal, of course. It kept throwing itself at the door, snarling and clawing. I was frozen with terror. Then, like that, it stopped. Silence. I stayed huddled on the floor, too terrified to move. Didn't sleep another wink that night. I waited for the sun to come up, every creak of the old wood sending jolts through me. At dawn, I cautiously approached the door. There were huge gouge marks clawed into the wood, and a sickening, musky smell hung in the air. I didn't waste any time packing my gear. Drove straight out of there and didn't stop until I hit the main highway. When I got back into cell range, the first thing I did was try to do some research. Turns out, there were legends in the area. Old stories whispered about a creature that walked like a man but had the head of a wolf. Locals called it a skinwalker, or something like that. I was skeptical at first, figured it was just folklore. But after what I saw, I wasn't so sure anymore. Didn't go back to the hill country for a long time. Still have trouble sleeping when I'm out in the wilderness. My buddies gave me a lot of crap when I tried to tell them what happened. One of them joked that maybe I should get into Bigfoot photography instead. It was no joke to me. I spent hours scouring the internet, reading every first-hand account of dogman sightings I could find. There were more than I expected, scattered all over the country. Most folks dismissed it as nonsense, the rest seemed legitimately spooked. Started to think I wasn't alone, wasn't crazy. Then, there was the news report. A rancher, a couple of counties over, filmed something weird on his security cameras. Grainy footage, but it sent chills down my spine. A tall, loping shape moving through the pasture looked just like that thing at the shack. The local sheriff said it was likely a coyote with mange. The rancher wasn't buying it. Neither was I. A few weeks back, I finally made myself head back out to that area. When armed this time had a shotgun and a pistol. Found the abandoned shack again. No sign of that creature, but the damage to the door was still there. It felt, defiant, somehow, me being back there. I'm not going out there at night again. Don't know what that thing was, if it was some twisted animal, a legend come to life, or something else entirely. But I know one thing for sure. The next time I hear a scratch at the door in the middle of nowhere, I'm not opening it to find out what's on the other side. This happened to me a couple of years back. Hard to believe it sometimes, feels like a lifetime ago. My name's Alex. I work construction, always have. Nothing glamorous, but it pays the rent. Me and a few of the guys, Pete, Rick, and Marcus, well, we do a hunting trip every fall. It's a chance to get away from the job site, the wives, everything, just sweat, beer, and a bit of good-natured ribbing. This time around, we decided on the White Mountain National Forest over in New Hampshire. Those ridges and old-growth trees make you feel like you're on another planet. First day, we set up camp on a bluff overlooking a river. The usual routine, pitch the tents, build the fire pit, crack open a few cold ones. The air was crisp, the sky clear. You'd get used to that city smog, forget what real stars look like. Marcus, always the joker, starts in on one of his campfire stories. Talking about skinwalkers and Bigfoot sightings in the area, that kind of stuff. Pete's giving him a hard time about it, which just eggs him on. Me and Rick just laughed. Nothing like city boys pretending they know the first thing about the wilderness. That night, I could have sworn I heard something outside the tent. 
scratching sounds, maybe the rustling of branches. I wrote it off as a deer or something. Happens all the time on these trips. Second day goes by without a hitch. We stalked a few bucks but no clear shot, so we ended up just hiking and swapping stories by the fire. Third morning is when things start getting weird. We were about halfway up a trail when Marcus stops dead in his tracks. Hey guys, he says, his voice low. Smell that? We all sniff the air. There's a faint smell, kind of like wet dog, but sharper, more acrid. It takes a while for it to register, but once I do, my gut twists all wrong. That's not a natural smell. Then, Pete points to the ground. Tracks, he says. We crowd around. It's hard to make them out in the soil, but they're huge. Not bear-sized, and not hoof-shaped like a deer. They look more like, well, a giant dog print, with the claws sunk deep into the dirt. A chill runs down my spine. We all know what we're thinking, but nobody says it out loud. Should we head back? Rick asks nervously. Now, Rick is the biggest dude in the crew. Fearless kind of guy takes no crap from anyone. To see him like this, it set us all on edge. I clear my throat, try to sound more confident than I feel. Let's push on a bit more. It could be a stray. Keep your eyes peeled. We make it to our hunting spot with nobody saying a word. We fan out, but there's no sign of any game. The woods feel dead silent, like everything's holding its breath. After an hour, I give it up, signal to the guys that it's time to pack it in. As we're heading back, I glance over my shoulder. For a split second, I see a flash of movement between the trees. I whirl around but there's nothing there. The rest of the day, I couldn't shake that feeling of being watched. By the time night fell, I was ready to call it quits. I suggest we hike out the next morning, but Marcus and Pete, being stubborn as mules, insisted we stay. Just one more night, they say, maybe our luck would change. Worst mistake we ever made. We went to sleep early, but I lay there wide awake. Every little snap of a twig made my heart jump. Then it started, a strange howl, rising and falling, echoing through the trees. Nothing like a coyote or a wolf, this was deeper, more guttural. I heard Rick stirring in his tent, his voice shaky. What the hell is that? My throat was too tight to answer. Then it came again, closer this time. And with it, that same damn stench, like something rotten. There was a sudden rustling from Pete's tent, then a scream, cut off sharp. Marcus and I scrambled out, guns raised. Pete's tent was ripped to shreds, a pool of blood spreading out into the dirt, with his sleeping bag dragged off deeper into the woods. The three of us huddled together, guns shaking in our hands. We didn't speak, the silence broken only by ragged breaths and the thudding of our hearts. Then, the howling erupted again, louder, coming from multiple directions. We were surrounded. What do we do? Rick whimpered, his voice barely above a whisper. Panic threatened to swallow me whole, but a cold, primal instinct took over. Run! I choked out the word voice rough. Just run. We didn't need to be told twice. We bolted through the trees, blind with terror. Branches whipped our faces, rocks tore into our boots, but we kept running. I tripped, sprawling headfirst onto the ground, the sound of snarling at my back. Rolling onto my side, I saw it. The creature was monstrous. It stood taller than any man, hunched over on powerful legs, it's fur matted with dirt and blood. The head, that's what made my blood run cold. Stretched and narrow like a wolf's muzzle, but with rows of razor-sharp teeth. 
eyes glowed with an unholy yellow light, fixed on me. It lunged. I barely managed to scramble out of the way, its claws ripping through my jacket. Behind me, I heard Marcus scream, a horrible gurgling sound. Didn't even have time to look back. Pushing myself up, I ran, tears streaming down my face. My lungs burned, my legs were lead, but the terror fueled me on. I burst through the tree lean and onto a dirt road, stumbling to a stop. Gasping for breath, I turned to see if the creature was following. Nothing. Only the silent, looming forest. I was alive. Barely. I made it back to the highway on numb legs, flagged down a truck. The driver called the cops, but my story of a monster in the woods earned me an overnight stay in the local psych ward. When the park rangers finally went to investigate our campsite, they found nothing. No remains of Pete or Marcus, no torn tents, no blood. The only evidence I had were the scars on my body and a broken mind. That was years ago. They never figured out what was out there, wrote the whole thing off as a wild animal attack gone wrong. But I know the truth. I saw that thing, smelled its foul breath, felt the heat of its eyes on my skin. People call me crazy now. Maybe they're right. Maybe this whole thing was just a nightmare brought on by grief and shock. But there's a part of me, a dark, terrified part, that knows better. Nights are the worst. I still hear Pete's screams, Marcus gurgling gasps as the creature dragged him off. My dreams are filled with glowing yellow eyes and the sickening stench of something that's not quite animal. I don't sleep much these days. I've got a gun stashed under my bed, even though I know deep down it won't help. If that thing is still out there, it'll find me again. I just don't know how to find it first. Sometimes the urge to go back to those woods gets so strong it's like a physical ache. Find the creature, confront it, make it pay for my friends. But then I remember that muzzle, those glowing eyes, and the feeling of being hunted. That raw, primal terror is what keeps me sane. Life didn't go back to normal after the White Mountains. I lost my job, my girlfriend. They couldn't handle this broken version of me. Nowadays, I drift from town to town, never staying too long. I take odd jobs, construction mostly, keeps my hands busy, my mind focused on something other than the howl. I drink more than I should, trying to numb the memories but it never goes away. At every new job site, every empty bar, every lonely motel room, I feel them watching me. The yellow eyes in the shadows. The reek of wet fur and something unnaturally feral. It's only a matter of time until it decides to finish what it started. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003. I was working as a CIA field agent, and it was, well, let's just say it was the day I learned not everything can be explained. I had been in this business for close to 10 years at this point. I specialized in counterterrorism, working for a division you won't find on any government website. We handle the stuff that blurs the lines, stuff that crosses into realms that would have most people scoffing in disbelief. My partner, Ethan Reed, was a no-nonsense kind of guy, built like a damn tank with the temperament of an angry badger. Me? I was leaner and relied more on my wits and instincts. Between the two of us, we had enough firepower and experience to handle just about anything at least anything made of flesh and blood. The assignment had seemed straightforward enough. Intel had pinpointed a suspected terrorist cell operating out of a rural farmstead in the Midwest. Satellite surveillance suggested unusual activity, 
movements that hinted at some sort of operation in progress. Our job was to infiltrate, gather as much evidence as possible, and if necessary, neutralize the threat. We landed at twilight a few miles from the farmhouse. The October chill pricked at my exposed skin as we made our approach, cloaked by the descending darkness. The air hung heavy and silent. There wasn't a hint of the frantic activity Intel had predicted. No nervous sentries, no suspicious vehicles. Just quiet and emptiness. The farmhouse loomed ahead of us, a stark silhouette against the darkening sky. As we crept closer, I felt an unfamiliar unease creep into my gut. The hair on my arms prickled. Something was off. Ethan, ever the bull in a china shop, wanted to storm in, guns blazing. I held him back. My gut told me this place held more than your run-of-the-mill terrorists. We moved through a cornfield that bordered the property. Rustling stalks concealed us as we stalked toward the house, ears straining for any sound that broke the unnerving silence. Still nothing. The back door looked flimsy, an easy target. Ethan went for his lockpicks. One swift motion, a slight click and the door swung inward, revealing the darkened kitchen behind. I flicked on my tactical light, the beam cutting through the gloom. It was as if someone had hit pause. There was half-finished food on the table, chairs ask you. An open fridge door spilled its cool glow across the floor. The place reeked of sudden abandonment. We went room by room, the sterile white beams of our flashlights chasing away shadows. Nothing seemed disturbed, no signs of a struggle. It was more like these people had walked away in the middle of their lives, leaving everything behind. The cellar door stood slightly ajar at the end of the hallway. I gave Ethan a nod, and as one, we descended the creaking wooden steps into the suffocating darkness. The musty odor caught in my throat. This doesn't feel right, Jason, Ethan whispered. His voice echoed in the close quarters. My thoughts exactly. Something flickered in the furthest corner, a flash of reflected light. We raised our rifles, adrenaline surging as we cautiously moved forward. It was a newspaper clipping pinned to the cracked concrete wall. Ethan shone his light on it. The headline made my stomach turn. Locals vanish, police baffled. The accompanying article detailed the disappearance of four people who had resided at this very farmstead. They had vanished a week prior, leaving no clues, no witnesses, nothing. I glanced at Ethan his face etched with the same disquiet mirrored in my own. Before either of us could speak, the cellar seemed to implode. A rancid odor, like rotten eggs and decaying meat, filled the air. My eyes were drawn back to the corner where the newspaper hung. The creature was immense, a silhouette wreathed in shadows. Massive, Hunched shoulders tapered down to elongated limbs that ended in what I could only describe as claws. Its head twisted toward us, revealing twin pinpoints of a hellish, crimson glow for eyes. Terror seized me, but beneath that was an inexplicable curiosity. This thing was like nothing I had ever encountered. Before I could process the thought, the creature lunged. Ethan reacted first firing off a rapid burst from his rifle. I joined in. The reports shattered the claustrophobic quiet of the cellar, bullets tearing into the creature's shadowy form. It howled, a sound that was more like a tortured screech than any animal cry. The thing blurred, its movements impossible to track. In less than a heartbeat, it was upon Ethan, he screamed as a massive clawed hand sunk into his chest. He was flung bodily against the opposite wall, his rifle tumbling from his grip. I fired wildly, more out of desperation than strategy. The creature turned towards me, 
eyes burning like coals. I barely had time to dive sideways before a clawed hand slashed through the space I had just occupied. It crashed into the wall, pulverizing the concrete. I scrambled to my feet, searching for Ethan in the darkness. He lay crumpled against the far wall, a crimson tide spreading across his torso. Rage and terror fueled me. I unloaded my clip at the monstrosity. It hissed in what sounded like pain and retreated further into the gloom. My hands shook as I fumbled for a fresh magazine. The air was thick with the stench of blood and something far fouler, a creeping dread that threatened to overwhelm me. Ethan! I choked out his name. It was no use. He didn't respond. Pain knifed through my ribs. I must have been clipped by one of those claws. The creature stalked me in the darkness, its crimson eyes glowing with malevolent intent. I scanned the cellar, desperate for an escape route. There was nothing. I was trapped. I edged along the wall, keeping my distance from the hulking shape. Every inch of me expected to feel burning claws rip into my back. The silence was punctuated only by my ragged breaths and the creature's guttural hisses. My fingers snagged on something, an old tool rack. I snatched up a pry bar, its cold heft settling into my trembling hand. Better than nothing. Better than waiting to be slaughtered. The creature snarled, a guttural rumble that sent chills down my spine. I took a deep, steadying breath. Ethan's lifeless face flashed before my eyes, a wave of fury washing over me. A monstrous form lunged from the darkness. I swung the pry bar with all my might, a desperate gamble. It connected with a sickening thud throwing sparks. The creature roared, a pained, deafening sound that vibrated through the very ground. It staggered backward, momentarily dazed. My heart hammered against my ribs. This might be my only chance. I dashed towards the cellar stairs, vaulting upwards, driven by a surge of pure survival instinct. I slammed the cellar door shut, fumbled with the bolt, and rammed a chair under the handle to buy me time. I stumbled back into the kitchen, my vision blurring. Blood pounded in my ears. I had to get out of here. But the creature wouldn't stay trapped forever. It would batter its way through. I needed to act and act fast. Ignoring the pain in my ribs, I bolted for the back door. It was locked. Frantically, I scanned the kitchen for something, anything, that could help me. My eyes fell on a butcher's block on the countertop. A meat cleaver gleamed beside it. I grabbed the cleaver, its solid weight grounding me, then sprinted towards a window overlooking the backyard. With several desperate heaves, I shattered the pane, cold air rushing in. I clambered through the jagged opening, ripping my clothes and skin. I hit the ground and scrambled to my feet. My legs worked on instinct, propelling me into the cornfield. I could hear the cellar door splinter behind me, followed by the creature's furious, predatory roar. The stalks thrashed and whipped against me as I ran blinded by adrenaline and fear. I knew it wouldn't be long before the thing caught my scent, found my trail. Up ahead, I saw the dim outline of the tree line that marked the edge of the property. If I could make the woods, I might have a chance. I might be able to lose it, hide until help arrived. That sliver of hope was all that kept me going. The snarls and the rustling of corn grew closer. Then, a blood-curdling howl pierced the night. My breath hitched. It was almost upon me. I broke through the last row of corn and into the darkness of the woods. Lungs burning, I weaved through the trees, crashing through tangled undergrowth. I tripped over a gnarled root, sprawled out on the forest floor. A shadow loomed above me. I rolled, desperation fueling me, 
as the clawed hand slammed down, gouging out a chunk of earth where I had just been. I scrambled to my feet, the cleaver held before me, a flimsy defense, but it was all I had. The creature stalked me, its eyes blazing. This was it. My final stand. A twig snapped behind me. I froze, the creature momentarily distracted. Using the opportunity, I made a break for it, fueled by despair, zigzagging through the dense trees. Branches whipped at my face, but I didn't slow down. I had to keep moving, keep putting distance between myself and that thing. I stumbled out onto a narrow dirt road. To my right, the farmhouse glowed faintly in the distance. My legs wobbled, threatening to fail me, but I forced them to keep going. Suddenly, headlights cut through the darkness, blinding me. A pickup truck swerved onto the road, barely missing me. It skidded to a halt in a cloud of dust. Get in! A woman's frantic voice shouted. I didn't hesitate. I flung myself into the passenger seat, the door slamming shut behind me. The woman hit the gas, the truck roaring to life. She glanced at me, her face a mask of strained fear. What the hell is happening back there? What was that, that thing? My breath came in choked gasps. I, I don't know, I managed to say. We tore down the road, the farmhouse receding in the rearview mirror. As I stared into the darkness pressing in on us, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had barely escaped with my life. The aftermath was a blur of sterile hospital rooms, endless debriefings, and a gnawing emptiness that clung to me. Ethan was gone. The creature, whatever it was, had disappeared without a trace. No one believed me, of course. My official report detailed a terrorist cell gone rogue, a violent struggle, my partner's tragic death. The truth was classified, buried in some hidden file no one would ever see. They sent me home with medals and a pat on the back, conveniently ignoring the hollow look in my eyes. I left the agency, that much was certain. I couldn't go back to the lies, not after what I'd witnessed. The Midwest farmstead, the abandoned house, they became a ghost story whispered among agents, a terrifying tale spun at rookie hazing sessions. No one searched for the creature. The world remained oblivious as it always did. But I remember. Every damn night I remember. My name is Alex Shepard, and this happened to me on July 22, 1995. I was a special forces operator back then before they shunted me into the CIA's more clandestine activities. Me and my team were sent to Appalachia, West Virginia Territory to track down a militia group linked to a series of bombings. Routine operation, or so we thought. Appalachia is wild country. Steep mountains, thick forests, hollers so isolated even the locals give them a wide berth. A place where old ways die hard, and outsiders aren't exactly welcomed. Locals told us the militia was holed up at a disused coal mine, deep in the hills. We reached the mine entrance just before dawn. It was an ugly, crumbling structure, half reclaimed by the wilderness. Sergeant Hayes, our team leader, motioned us into position. Standard breach and clear, he murmured into the radio. Remember, these guys are armed and dangerous. But they're not trained soldiers. We go in fast, in tight formation, hit em hard. They won't know what hit em. I wasn't so sure about that. Something about the silence hanging over the mine felt off. You develop a sixth sense for that kind of thing after enough time in the field. I whispered a warning to the rookie beside me, a kid named Kowalski. 
He just grinned back, green and a little too eager. We stormed the entrance. The first wave went through, flash bangs detonating with deafening cracks, suppressing fire echoing through the narrow shaft. No return fire. No screams. Nothing. Hayes waved us forward, the second wave. I'd pushed through the choking dust and into the tunnel. And that's when I saw it. Or, more precisely, I saw them. Not militia goons with cheap assault rifles, but bodies. Men in tattered camouflage, torn apart in a way that no human could do. Limbs bent at gruesome angles, flesh shredded like it had been raked with giant talons. Blood everywhere, old and fresh. I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that whatever made those kills was still in there, waiting. Hayes swore low behind me. Where the hell are the militia? Fall back. Fall back. Easier said than done. The tunnel was tight, barely wide enough for two men to walk abreast. We stumbled as we tried to retreat, the radio crackling with panicked cries from the team at the entrance. That was when the roar came. It echoed through the tunnel, a bone-jarring bellow that wasn't quite animal, but wasn't anything I could name either. Then, the shadows at the far end of the tunnel shifted. A shape emerged, massive and hunched, moving with a fluid, unnatural speed. Open fire! Hayes shouted, but even as we raised our weapons, it was upon us. Kowalski, poor kid, got it first. The creature snatched him up like he weighed nothing, its jaws clamping down on his torso with a wet crunch. He didn't even have time to scream. There was chaos. Flashlights making wild arcs, gunshots deafening in the enclosed space, the stench of blood and something else, foul and musky. I fired until my rifle clicked dry. It didn't seem to do a damn thing. The creature was built for killing. Each clawed limb seemed to move independently, slashing and tearing its way through our ranks like we were made of paper. Its hide was thick, bullets glancing off uselessly. Someone yelled, Grenades! Two pineapples hit the ground near its feet. My heart lurched. Closed space, heavy explosives. It would kill us all. The explosions tore through the tunnel, and for a second, there was only blinding light and searing heat. Then silence. I coughed, the dust in my throat like acid. My ears rang, and my vision was blurred, but I was alive. Status! Hayes's voice, choked but steady. One by one, ragged voices answered. Half of us were gone. The rest were wounded, but at least the grenades had stopped the creature. Or so I thought. Hayes flicked on a fresh flashlight. In the beam of light, we saw that the grenades hadn't done any damage. The creature crouched amidst the debris, apparently unfazed. Then its head swiveled. In the darkness of the tunnel, its eyes shone with malevolent yellow light. Run! It was Kowalski, somehow still alive, a mangled mess on the floor. Run, you sons of... His voice cut off in a wet gurgle. We didn't need telling twice. Stumbling over the bodies of our comrades, we sprinted for the entrance. Behind us, the creature roared in fury, the sound propelling us forward in a blind panic. We burst out of the tunnel into the cold dawn air. I didn't look back until I reached the tree lean. The mine entrance was empty. The creature was gone, vanished back into the depths from which it came. The official story became a tragic training accident. Casualties covered up, survivors sworn to silence. I spent weeks in the military hospital, my wounds healing faster than any doc had ever seen. But the real damage wasn't physical. Nightmares stalked me, the echoing roar of the creature, the cold glimmer of those inhuman eyes. 
I left the military after that drifted for a while. The CIA snapped me up, figured I was already broken enough to handle the things normal people couldn't stomach. They weren't wrong. I spent years hunting, chasing shadows. Each report of mangled cattle, each unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country. I was there, hoping to face the monster again. Hoping, maybe, to put the damn thing down. Never found it. But I know, with an iron certainty, that it's still out there. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine I can hear that bone-chilling roar, and a cold sweat breaks out on my skin. Because out there, in the vast stretches of forgotten wilderness, the creature from the mine waits. Hunting. And one day, our paths might cross again. My name is Eric Townsend, and this happened to me in August of 2008. Back then, I was the epitome of the straight-laced government agent, suit and tie, shiny shoes, and a mind full of classified protocols. Now? Well, let's just say the suit doesn't fit anymore, and the shine's long gone off the world. They sent me to investigate a cluster of disappearances on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. Hikers, campers, even a few homeless folks drawn to the desert edge, vanished without a trace. Locals muttered about cartel violence, but there was a wrongness to the whole pattern. Too clean, too thorough. I figured it was something more organized, a cult maybe. The Bureau has a file on every flavor of lunatic, after all. My partner was Agent Garcia, seasoned, cynical, the kind of guy who'd seen too much darkness to be rattled anymore. We went undercover, jeans and hiking boots instead of crisp suits. Spend our days poking around the desert fringes, interviewing jittery witnesses, trying to piece together some thread of logic. A local ranger tipped us off about a system of caves out east of the city, rumored to be used for drug smuggling. Figured it was worth a look, a cult or cartel might hole up in a place like that. We went out under cover of darkness. The desert air was crisp, filled with a strange hum that set my teeth on edge, cicadas maybe, but too rhythmic. Flashlights cut through the gloom as we approached the cave mouth. The smell hit us first, metallic and sweet, like overripe fruit and old blood mixed together. Garcia swore under his breath, hand drifting to his sidearm. We edged cautiously into the darkness. The interior was surprisingly smooth, like the walls had been melted or carved, not formed naturally. Our flashlights picked up glistening trails on the ground, a viscous, iridescent slime. Then we found the source. Bones. Half dissolved, stripped of flesh, littered the cavern floor. They were segmented, insectal, like nothing I'd ever seen. And the size of them, it implied a creature straight out of a nightmare. Let's get the hell out of here. I hissed. There was too much bad history in those bones, too clear a sign that whatever lurked here wasn't human. We were halfway to the cave mouth when Garcia tripped. His flashlight went skittering, tumbling end over end into the blackness. Before we could react, the hum changed pitch, rising to a whine that drilled into my skull. The creature erupted from the darkness, a blur of chitinous plates and writhing limbs. It was far bigger than the bones suggested, the size of a small car. The head, it was a writhing mass of segmented eyes and dripping mandibles. It let loose a shriek somewhere between a buzzsaw and a howl that set off every alarm bell in my body. Garcia, bless him, didn't freeze. He opened fire, the gunshots deafening in the enclosed space. The rounds pinged off the thing's armor, barely slowing it down. It lunged for him, 
one segmented leg scything through the air. Garcia leapt aside, rolled with the impact, but not fast enough. The claw sliced his leg open, a spray of crimson across the rock. He screamed, more in rage than pain. Run! He roared at me. Don't look back, just run! I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the cave mouth, the creature's roar echoing behind me. Halfway out, I risked a glance back. Garcia had his back to a wall, emptying his pistol into the oncoming monstrous form. But the creature was too fast, too strong. I saw the claw sweep down, saw Garcia's body lifted, then the wet crunch as he was. I turned away, bow rising in my throat, and bolted out into the desert night. I ran until my lungs burned, until I collapsed gasping on the sandy ground. The creature didn't follow. Maybe the gunshot spooked it, maybe it preferred dark spaces. It didn't matter, I was alive, Garcia was. Garcia was dead, fulfilling that most dreaded of agent duties, sacrificial pawn to buy time. I got up shakily, stumbled my way back to civilization. The aftermath is the usual bureaucratic mess. The Bureau sanitized the incident, covering up Garcia's death as a freak hiking accident. I know better. They offered me a desk job, compensation for my ordeal. I took it, though a part of me rebelled against the safety. My apartment has the blinds drawn 24-7, and I jump at every creak in the floorboards. That hum, the insecto whine, lingers in my dreams, and with it the image of Garcia's shattered body. People tell me I'm lucky to be alive. I guess. But some days, out here in the gray anonymity of my new life, I feel more trapped than ever, just waiting for the darkness to seep up through the cracks. Because that creature is still out there. Somewhere in the depths of those desert caves, it lives, it grows. Breeding, maybe, creating more of its monstrous kind. And the next time someone ventures too close, the next time some curious hiker or hapless soul stumbles on its lair, there won't be anyone like Garcia to save them. My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me in September 2014. I'm a National Park Ranger, Redwood National Forest in Northern California. Beautiful place, towering trees, damp moss, the ocean fog lending everything a magical feel. Also, a damn good place to vanish without a trace, but maybe folks don't think about that when they set out on the trails. We'd been tracking a pair of experienced hikers for days by that point. Gone missing the week before, no cell reception to speak of out there, and the search grid was a tangled mess of ravines and old-growth forest. Helicopters were useless, the tree canopy too thick. It was all boots on the ground, a slow, grueling slog that turned up nothing. Day 4 I was with a team of three other rangers, grizzled vets led by a woman named Sarita. We were beat, morale low, when we found the first sign, a ripped and bloody backpack, snagged on a branch near a game trail. That kicked us into overdrive. The trail led us deeper into the ancient heart of the forest, the sunlight barely filtering through the leaves. It was there amongst the mossy trunks of trees older than civilization, that we found the bodies. Or rather, what was left of them. The first was strung between two redwoods, what little remained of it dangling from some makeshift rigging of vines and branches. Hard to piece together what happened, but it looked deliberate, ritualistic almost. Sarita swore under her breath, crouched to get a closer look. Bear attack, maybe? See those claw marks? Her voice cut off as she looked up. More vines, dripping with something wet, 
crisscrossed the space between the trees like a grotesque spider web. And at its center, swaying slightly in the breeze, hung the second body. No, not the whole body. Just the legs, severed cleanly at the hip. The rest gone. I remember feeling sick, not scared. That came later. Right then, there was just a clinical detachment, like my brain couldn't process the scene as real. Someone on the team choked back a sob, another turned away to vomit. Sarita, hardened as she was, looked stunned. We radioed it in, and soon enough the whole area was swarming with more rangers, forensics, the whole nine yards. But there was one detail no one mentioned over the official channels. We were following a trail of blood going up. It splattered the massive trunks of those redwoods, leading impossibly high into the canopy. Sarita followed it with her binoculars. Said she saw something, a shape hunched in the shadows, watching us. That night, back at base camp, we got the forensic report. Whatever did this wasn't human, and it sure as hell wasn't a bear. Bite marks on the bones were all wrong, the pattern too wide. Speculation swirled, hushed and panicked. Mountain lion gone rogue? Some feral human, maybe a survivalist gone off the deep end? None of it sat right with me. There was a plan to what we found out there, something methodical and cruel. It reminded me of old stories, of something lurking in these woods since long before the first settlers, something the native tribes whispered about in fear. That night, I lay awake, the air heavy with the scent of pine and something I couldn't name, a rot beneath the life. Come dawn, Sarita was gone. Took a jeep, said she was scouting new search areas, alone. We were supposed to break camp, but something held me back. Instinct, I guess. I followed her tracks. They weren't hard to find. Sarita wasn't trying to be subtle, like she wanted. No, lured someone to her. The trail wound through some of the thickest, most untouched sections of forest I'd ever encountered. It ended in a small clearing ring by redwoods so immense they dwarfed any I'd ever seen. At the center of that clearing was a tree larger still. I swear it pulsed when I looked at it directly, like the bark was breathing. And below. Sarita lay sprawled on the ground, eyes wide in shock. She was still alive, but just barely. I ran to her side, fumbling for my medical kit. That's when I saw the blood trail leading away from her into the shadows beneath that monstrous tree. It was fresh, and whatever made it was big. Sarita gasped, choked out a single word. Wendigo. Then she went limp. I knew that word. Old native legends, spirit of hunger, of insatiable greed. Some folks in these parts still believe, swear there's something out there that ain't natural. I used to dismiss it, campfire stories to scare tourists. Not anymore. Now I was alone, injured woman on the ground, and whatever made that blood trail was still out there. I checked my pistol. Only six rounds left. Not much, but it was better than nothing. Carefully, I stood, following the crimson splashes on the forest floor. The trail led me toward the base of that impossible tree. There, half hidden in the shadows, was a yawning, cave-like opening in the trunk. The overpowering stench of decay and wet animal fur nearly knocked me back. My flashlight beam pierced the darkness within the tree, and I saw it. Huge, twice the size of any man, hunched on four legs. Its skin was leathery, stretched tight over bulging bones, and its face, skull-like, with pits for eyes that glowed with a yellow light. But it was those teeth, a row of jagged spikes, that did me in. My legs felt like water. I couldn't run, couldn't scream. The creature, hungry and patient, began to step out from the darkness. 
pure instinct took over. I raised my pistol and fired. The shots echoed through the ancient grove, deafening in the unnatural stillness. The creature jerked but didn't go down. It hissed, a sound like steam escaping a rusty pipe, and lunged. I fired again and again, stumbling backward. Emptying the magazine was muscle memory, a futile hope in the face of those glowing eyes and outstretched claws. The creature crashed into me, knocking me hard against the unyielding bark of the redwood. I felt the rib crack, pain exploding in my chest. Dropped the useless gun, fumbling for my knife even as I was pinned. Fear fueled a final burst of desperate strength. I heaved upward and managed to bury the knife somewhere in the creature's exposed shoulder. It shrieked, a sound that set my teeth on edge, and its grip loosened enough for me to slip free. It circled me, wounded but far from dead. That's when I saw the vines thick, fibrous ones hanging like ropes from the upper branches. A crazy idea flared to life, the last gasp of a cornered animal. I lunged for one, dodging a snap of those monstrous jaws, and swung. The vine held my weight, just barely. I kicked off from the tree trunk, propelling myself upward in a clumsy, panic scramble. The creature snarled, swiping at my dangling feet as I hauled myself into the lower branches. It began to climb, which was both good and bad. Meant I could get higher, but also meant that if it reached me, there was nowhere left to go. Panic edged out reason. I climbed, ignoring the ache of my ribs, the blood dripping down my arm from where a claw had raked me. Then I heard the sounds below, shouts, the crackle of radios, the heavy tramp of boots. Backup was closing in, alerted by the gunfire. The creature froze, then looked down, its eyes reflecting the first flickers of approaching flashlights. A moment of decision, then it turned and melted back into the darkness within the tree with unsettling speed. It took me hours to fully explain what happened. My story wasn't received well. Disbelief on the faces of the seasoned rangers, whispers of stress-induced delusions when the forensics crew found no trace of the vanished creature, not even a blood trail. Sarita didn't make it. Her injuries, those inflicted by the creature, were too severe. When I tried to explain, they looked at me with pity. Official report, animal attack. Cougar, bear, they never settled on which. Me? I got put on extended leave. Saw a therapist who specialized in trauma. They gently hinted about PTSD, offered pills to quiet my nightmares. I didn't take them. Staying numb wouldn't bring back Sarita or erase the memory of those glowing eyes. Couldn't go back to the park service, not after that. Took a job driving a truck, long halls where the open road stretched to the horizon. Every time I saw a wooded area, my fingers would ghost the shape of my pistol, and I'd check the rearview mirror expecting to see those yellow eyes in the encroaching darkness. The Wendigo, or whatever it was, sometimes I thought it was all a hallucination, my brain desperately trying to explain the unexplainable. Then, other nights, I would swear I heard the faintest echo of that monstrous hiss on the wind. There's stories about these things going back centuries, whispered tales from native tribes scattered across North America. Descriptions chillingly similar, always with that insatiable hunger. But stories fade, become legends, and legends get dismissed as campfire tales. Makes it easier for the creatures lurking in the shadows, lets them hunt unchallenged. I'm not a ranger anymore, but my watch isn't over. I keep an ear out for strange tales missing hikers, bodies found with inexplicable injuries. Got enough saved up to buy a beat-up old RV, and some supplies. Supplies a ranger wouldn't need, vials of silver nitrate gleaned from back alley dealers, 
heavy gauge chains meant to hold something a lot stronger than a bear, books filled with half-forgotten lore about the old ways of fighting things that aren't supposed to exist. The rational part of me doubts it all, figures I'm chasing ghosts fueled by grief and guilt. But there's that other part, the part that remembers the stench of rotting flesh and the relentless hunger in those glowing eyes. And that part knows better. They say lightning doesn't strike twice. They say monsters aren't real. But somewhere out there, a young ranger might stumble across a tattered backpack, a trail of blood leading further into the trees. And if I'm anywhere nearby, if there's the slightest chance, well, like I said, my watch isn't over. I drive on, the setting sun throwing long shadows across the asphalt ahead. Just a grizzled old trucker with a haunted past, or maybe the only thing standing between us and the things that slip through the cracks of the world. Time will tell which version is true. My name is Elias Cartwright, and this happened to me in July of 1997. I was a rookie park ranger in Yosemite, fresh from my forestry management degree and full of wide-eyed idealism. Don't get me wrong, I was prepared for the rough and tumble of the job, but not for whatever that was. It started as a missing persons case. An older couple, the Millers, had disappeared while on a hiking trail. Routine enough. I joined the search team and we scoured the area. Nothing turned up that first day. Day two, we expanded the search radius, hitting some lesser-known paths. I ended up taking point on a winding, heavily forested route leading to a waterfall. Anyone who knows Yosemite knows there's plenty of danger aside from getting lost cliffs, wild animals, flash floods, you name it. The trail was quiet. Too quiet. The usual bird song and rustling of leaves felt strangely absent. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my rising nerves and the seriousness of the situation. After a couple more hours, I saw the waterfall through the trees. And that's when I saw the blood. It was splattered across the rocks at the base of the falls, a gruesome trail leading towards the dense woods on the far side. I hesitated, hand drifting to the safety catch of my sidearm. Protocol dictated waiting for backup, but my gut twisted with dread. This wasn't a simple accident. I followed the blood trail into the trees, the silence now oppressive. The air crackled with a tension that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Each step brought an expectation of discovering something terrible. That expectation proved chillingly accurate. The body wasn't the Miller's. It belonged to a young woman, maybe mid-twenties. I won't detail the condition of her remains. Let's just say whoever or whatever did that was no typical predator. An image flashed through my mind, an old ranger's campfire story about someone finding similar mutilations, the work of an unknown cryptid deep in the backcountry. I'd scoffed at it then. Not so much now. I marked my position on the GPS and was about to radio it in when something moved in the shadows a flicker at the edge of my vision. I spun, gun drawn, but there was nothing there. That's when I saw it out of the corner of my eye again, a glimpse of lean movement just beyond the trees. It was huge, far bigger than any bear. Fur, I thought, dark against the shadows. But the way it seemed to flow rather than shift with the motion, wrong. A low rumble came from the trees, not a growl, more like a vibration that went right through my boots. And that shape, it moved closer. Yellow eyes blinked in the darkness, twin pinpricks of malevolent light. They were too high off the ground, the spacing too wide. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't something I recognized. 
Every instinct I had screamed at me to run, but my feet were frozen. It charged. I barely had time to raise my gun. I squeezed off two shots, the cracks shattering the forest stillness. One hit, I think. It let out a roar that shook the branches, a shriek of rage overlaid with something inhuman. Then it was gone, bounding away through the undergrowth. I radioed for help, my voice shaking. The search and rescue team arrived with a speed that told me they thought I'd cracked. They found my markings by the girl's body, signs of a struggle, the blood trail. But of the creature, nothing. There were more victims after that. Always alone, always with strange, inexplicable injuries. The official explanation became elusive mountain lions, unconfirmed bear attacks, whatever fit the mangled evidence. I knew better. They never caught it. Never even came close. I left Yosemite a year later, haunted by the memories and the sound of that impossible roar. To this day, I don't know what I encountered. Whatever it is, it's still out there. My name's Kate Warren. And this happened to me on October 17, 2014, deep in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Been working these woods my whole life, just like my pappy before me. Knew them trails like the back of my hand, thought nothing could surprise me anymore. Guess I was wrong about that. It began with a missing persons case. Two college kids on a weekend camping trip gone off the grid. Folks get lost up in these mountains all the time, but something about this felt different. No sign of their gear, no sign of them at all, not a trace. Now, that set off alarm bells. Started wondering if maybe some drifter or escaped con was hiding out, preying on the unwary. I was tasked with leading the search party up into the higher elevations where they'd last been seen. We went in packing heavy, Rifles, emergency supplies, the works. Wasn't expecting to find some Boy Scouts out for a casual hike. The woods felt heavy, air thick even for autumn. Team was on edge too, a sense that we weren't alone out there. We made camp that night in a narrow valley, intending to continue the search at daybreak. After dinner, I decided to take a perimeter walk old ranger habits die hard. Straight a little ways from the firelight, just scanning the tree line. That's when I heard it, a rustling sound, then a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Wasn't no animal I recognized. Back at camp, everyone was asleep. It was probably nothing, I told myself. Probably some half-starved coyote. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I spent the rest of the night listening to the symphony of crickets punctuated by the occasional snap of a branch, the hoot of an owl, and something else. Something that sounded far too big, far too close for comfort. The next morning broke cold and clear. We began our search again, spreading out to cover more ground. Hours passed without a sign. I found myself gravitating to the area's most overgrown, the tangled thickets of rhododendron. Something told me these kids hadn't wandered far from where they began. By midday, two of my team were getting jumpy. They'd heard those noises too, swore they saw shadows just out of sight. It wasn't their imaginations. Then, just ahead, the bushes trembled, and a massive shape burst forth. For a moment, my mind went blank. This thing was a nightmare made flesh. Standing at least nine feet tall, caked in mud and who knows what else. It was impossibly strong-looking, muscles rippling beneath a coat of thick black fur. The head was hard to describe. Small and hunched forward, with a flat, 
protruding snout and tiny black eyes full of predatory cunning. It roared, bearing rows of vicious teeth, and that's when the smell hit me, like rotting meat and something altogether fouler. I shouted for the team to fall back, raising my rifle and firing off warning shots. The thing flinched, then charged forward, its speed terrifying. We fell back in disarray, firing as we went. The creature barreled forward heedless of the gunfire. It lunged at a young ranger named Beth, its clawed hand the size of a bear trap raking across her torso. She screamed, then crumpled to the ground. Chaos then. Shots rang out, and the creature let out an enraged roar. I saw it grab another ranger, Tom, and toss him aside like a broken doll. Then, as suddenly as it materialized, it was gone, vanishing into the undergrowth with impossible agility. I sprinted to Beth, the world blurring around me. Blood soaked through my hands as I tried to stop the bleeding. Her eyes stared lifelessly up at the sky. Tom's fate wasn't much better. He lay sprawled against a tree, legs mangled, neck twisted at an unnatural angle. Only one other ranger, Jensen, had escaped and scathed, his face pale with shock. The three of us were all that remained of the search party, left staring at the mangled remains of our comrades. The creature had moved off. It could be anywhere, watching us, stalking, waiting. We radioed for backup, voices trembling. But who the hell would believe us? Ranger deaths, sure. Animal attack, maybe. But a hulking, unidentified monster that shrugged off gunfire? Backup came, of course. Arm support, even a chopper circling overhead. What they didn't find was the creature. They did find the bodies, the campsite ransacked, and the remnants of an animal carcass nearby, torn to bloody ribbons. They also found footprints, huge prints unlike anything in the official wildlife guides. The official report went with mountain lion attack. Easier to swallow, I suppose. Easier to avoid the media frenzy and uncomfortable questions about what else lurked out there. It didn't bring back Beth or Tom, didn't change the fact that whatever we encountered that day wasn't natural, wasn't simply part of the ecosystem. They told me to take leave. Said I was suffering shock trauma. Maybe they were right. But I couldn't sit still. Couldn't forget the creature's malevolent glare, the sickening reek of its fur. Couldn't forget Beth's last, terrified scream. Left the mountains for a while, drifted, did odd jobs. But the nightmares followed me. Now I'm back. Not working as a ranger anymore, at least not officially. I patrol different wilderness areas now, the sprawling forests and swamplands, chasing rumors of hunters disappearing, hikers vanishing. I leave notes, warnings for those brave enough or foolish enough to venture into the deepest parts of the backcountry. Beware. Predator at large. Someone has to do it. Someone has to stand between the innocent and the things that lurk in the shadows. It's a lonely existence, a thankless one. And one of these days, that creature or one of its kin will find me again. I know that except that. It's an ugly world sometimes. But even the ugliest truths need to be brought to light. My pursuit became an obsession. I'd spot a story in the local papers, an unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country, and I'd be on the road. Each new location offered a twisted puzzle. Tracks defying identification, half-eaten animal carcasses, the lingering whispers of terrified witnesses. I'd camp alone in the woods for weeks, my senses always on high alert, waiting for the slightest hint of movement, the faintest whiff of that putrid musk in the air. I started keeping even more detailed records. I meticulously catalogued each encounter, each footprint or shredded campsite. 
cross-referenced the sightings, mapped likely hunting ranges. Those creatures weren't random. There were patterns emerging, a preference for dense, old-growth forests, a tendency to stick to the fringes of civilization. They were intelligent, adaptable, and they were becoming bolder. The obsession came at a cost. Relationships unraveled. Anyone who stuck around long enough saw the haunted look in my eyes, the way I jump at every creaking floorboard. My savings dwindled, replaced by a collection of worn trail boots, battered binoculars, and a shotgun that rarely left my side. Didn't matter. This was bigger than any one person. One trail led north, way up into the isolated forests along the U.S.-Canadian border. There, I befriended a wiry, weathered old trapper named Hank, one of the few who believed my outlandish tales. Hank swore he'd seen something monstrous up on the ridgeline above his cabin, something that snatched one of his traps clean off its chain, a trap that could hold a grizzly. We spent a week up in those woods, laying out extra traps, cameras, waiting for the creature to return. It did on the fourth night. But it wasn't alone. I woke to Hank's panicked shouts and gunfire ripping through the darkness. I scrambled out of my tent, sleep-fogged and disoriented. The clearing in front of Hank's cabin was a scene of utter chaos. Hank was slumped against the porch, already gone, his chest ripped open by monstrous claws. One of the creatures, the same massive brood I remembered from the Smokies, stood over his body, blood dripping from its fangs. It turned, pinning me in the glare of those beady, malevolent eyes. A younger, smaller creature flanked it, for dappled with Hank's fresh blood. Rage and grief ignited within me. This was personal now. I raised my rifle and fired, a desperate act of defiance. The bigger creature snarled, swiping a massive paw in my direction. I dove for cover, rolling behind the remains of Hank's woodshed. Splinters flew as the creature demolished the structure with brute force. I was pinned down, heart pounding like a war drum. Another gunshot. The younger creature cried out in pain. I risked a glance and saw it limping away into the trees, a streak of red trailing behind. One down, at least. But the larger one, the real threat, was still focused on ripping me to shreds. Hope flared when a vehicle roared up the dirt path leading to the cabin. Two figures, strangers, leaped out, armed to the teeth. They'd heard the commotion, they shouted, we're here to help. For a fleeting second, I believed salvation had arrived. But something was wrong. Their movements were jerky, awkward, their expressions fixed. Then I noticed the way their eyes gleamed in the moonlight, those same small, black, unnaturally intelligent eyes. More of those creatures, wearing human skin. I opened my mouth to shout a warning, but it was too late. The two newcomers turned their guns on me. The first shot slammed into my shoulder, sending me sprawling. Another tore through the flimsy cover of the woodshed. The hulking creature was closing in, sensing my vulnerability, relishing the kill. This was it. After all those years, all those solitary miles, it would end not with a hero's stand, but a desperate demise in this remote, blood-soaked clearing. Then, as if called from a nightmare, a new sound split the air. It started as a low rumble, rising to a deep, ground-shaking roar. Something dark and impossibly huge crashed through the treeling. The creatures, including the one closing in on me, froze, confusion replacing their bloodlust. From the shadows emerged a bear, but a bear like none I'd ever seen twice the size of a grizzly, with a broad chest and claws the length of machetes. Its eyes blazed with not just animal fury, but a chilling, primal intelligence. 
It charged the creatures with a roar that rattled my bones. The bear was a blur of fur and teeth. One of the disguised creatures barely had time to raise its gun before the bear ripped it apart in a spray of blood. The other fled, scrambling for its truck. The monstrous creature that had stalked me, the killer of Beth and Tom, hesitated, then turned to face this new threat. What followed was a clash of titans. The bear and the creature tore into each other, the clearing shaking with the force of their blows. I scrambled to my feet, my wounded shoulder screaming in protest. The newcomer's truck sputtered to life, its tires spinning as it disappeared down the dirt track. I fumbled with my rifle, but the fight raged beyond my ability to intervene. This was their battle now, fought for reasons I couldn't fathom. And as quickly as it started, it was over. The creature, outmatched in sheer size and power, lay crumpled on the blood-soaked ground. The giant bear stood above it, breathing heavily, a fresh gash across its flank. It turned its massive head and looked directly at me. And in that moment, I felt a surge of understanding. This bear, this impossibly large protector of the wilds, it was connected to those creatures in a way I didn't grasp. Part of some ancient balance I was only beginning to glimpse. The bear lumbered away, disappearing back into the trees with the same eerie silence it had appeared from. I stood there shaking, the world tilted on its axis. As dawn spilled over the clearing, I saw the damage in stark light. Hank's lifeless form. The monstrous corpses, still unsettlingly human-like. The remnants of a battle that defied understanding. The aftermath is a blur. I made the call, gave the report filled with words like, Bear attack, unknown assailants. More lies to cover up a truth too dangerous to tell. They buried Hank and cleaned up the clearing, sanitizing the scene into something explainable, something easy to forget. I continued to wander, following the trail of blood and whispers. That battle up north changed me. Now I'm not just a hunter, but a witness to a hidden world, a world where nature itself fights back against the crawling darkness. The quest isn't about killing those creatures anymore. It's about learning, about understanding the forces at play out there. And maybe, just maybe, finding a way for all of us, human and other, to survive together. Every shift in life came with routine. As a park ranger stationed at Yosemite, most evenings were spent patrolling familiar trails and ensuring the safety of both the wildlife and the few campers who dared stay overnight. With a duty to protect, I, Tucker Embry, with more than a decade under my belt, believed I had seen all there was to see within the park's shadows. This evening was like any other until I reached a part of the forest where the air felt still, too still for comfort. There were no birds chirping. It was as if every creature held its breath. From my right, a snap of twigs led my hand to the sidearm strapped at my hip precautionary measures embedded into muscle memory. Ahead lay what seemed like remnants of a campsite ravaged by unknown forces. Tents torn apart with personal belongings scattered, a haunting aftermath. Why didn't they call for help? This thought echoed in my mind as I radioed into base stating my findings. Maybe they did try, but signals in these parts often got lost between the towering pines. Pressing on further into the brush, a sense of dread crept over me while approaching an otherworldly sound, a series of low growls punctuated by deeper groans that betrayed an animalistic origin. My heartbeat pounded against its cage. Simple ranger training never prepared you for confrontations unknown to mankind. Suddenly, through the opaque fog lingering among ancient trees, 
I caught sight of an indiscernible form moving with unsettling grace. Its limbs were elongated, too long and ending in talon-like appendages that stripped bark from trees with ease. It stood well over seven feet tall when it reared up on hind legs with peering eyes reflecting moonlight like mirrors. Zane Landell and Kira Milner, fellow rangers who'd chosen this life rooted in their love for untamed wilderness, had joined me earlier but wandered off to check the eastern trailhead while I investigated noises near our location. One call for backup was all I could afford before going silent to not alert this entity of my precise whereabouts. As I circled back quietly hoping to reconvene with Zane and Kira for support, their absence not at me more than the chill from within these woods ever could. The possibility of them encountering what lurked here twisted my gut like wrung cloth. Preparing myself for whatever altercation lay ahead, metal cool against skin, I weighed every life saved against every unsolved disappearance within these forests, figures lost to nature's enigma or something far worse. Unsanctioned trails ablaze in my mind, paths not meant for hikers or even rangers without sufficient light to guide them home. Heart thudding louder now as each step brought me closer to confronting this wraith-like beast which shredded through underbrush towards an unseen prey. Its form vaguely humanoid yet entirely foreign, nebulous save for two piercing eyes that hunted with intent. The sound of splitting wood signaled its rapid advance. I kept low, moving carefully through the dense underbrush, the cold metal of my service weapon a small comfort in my grip. Every crack of twig or rustle of leaves heightened my senses. I reached for my radio intent on calling Zane and Kira to return, but the silent void from their end earlier held me back. The risk of noise felt too great with the creature so near. The creature now stood clear in a moonlit glade, towering and grotesque. Muscles rippled beneath its hairless skin as it hunched forward, sniffing the air for scent. Its ears twitched at each sound. Long, Hooked claws hung from equally long arms that almost dragged on the ground as it stalked its quarry with precise, deliberate steps. Breath caught in my throat. I pushed further back into shadow. Inaction was my only recourse. This beast presented a physical prowess beyond any human capability to confront directly. The sound of a panicked bird erupted from a nearby bush. The creature lunged with savage speed, claws rending flesh and feather with equal ease. Blood soaked into the earth as it consumed its catch, grotesque sounds filling the quiet forest. The finality hit me, the reality that our responsibility for visitor safety might be compromised by this predator, and ultimately decided against the distress call that might draw it closer to Zane and Kira or other rangers who'd come unprepared. Silently, I backed away step by cautious step until distance allowed a rush to camp where others lay in naive safety. My report was met with disbelief until dawn revealed the carnage left on that moonlit glade. Speculation arose in hushed whispers among us about what sort of animal could execute such ferocity without leaving abundant traces during weeks that followed. Biologists were summoned. Conversations revolved around undiscovered species or mutations provoked by unknown causes. We mourned Zane's loss. A strip of his torn uniform found near the scene was confirmation enough, and lamented our inability to protect him from the unforeseen horror within our very domain. Our forest was closed indefinitely to visitors. Armed professionals roamed searching for this unseen menace which had seemingly vanished as mysteriously as it appeared. In the weeks that followed, we found solace in restructuring our operations for greater safety, telling ourselves stories of natural balance and unknown wonders lurking just beyond comprehension seemed less comforting yet more fitting than any tale we might fabricate to explain away the terror we faced that night. I often revisit that glade under daylight's clarity and yearn for mundane explanations but find none, 
only stark reality remains alongside memories of Zane and questions about what truly resides within nature's enigmatic embrace. I remember the day I took the job as a park ranger at Yosemite National Park quite clearly despite it being years ago. Spending my days protecting the wild, I thought, encapsulated my love for nature and solitude. My name is Zephyr Malloy, a man who has found peace among trees older than any living soul. My days were spent patrolling, ensuring visitors respected these ancient grounds. That morning started with the routine check of trails to make sure they were clear for hikers. The air was crisp, carrying with it the scent of pine and damp earth after a recent rainfall. As I walked, I came across debris from what looked like an animal attack, gnarled branches smeared with dark stains that I hoped were berry juice. But nature has a way of divulging her secrets, and the unmistakable metallic scent told me otherwise. I radioed in for assistance but to no avail. The communication system chose that day of all days to fail. My training kicked in. I took photographs and marked GPS coordinates on my map for the rangers who would investigate this incident. Several hours passed uneventfully until a frantic hiker approached me near El Capitan. She spoke in a hurried torrent about her friend who had gone missing after wandering off the trail earlier in the day. Dread bloomed in my chest as I realized this was likely no simple case of a lost traveler. By nightfall, my search dog, Naima, and I had canvassed the area. The forest seemed to close in around us with an unusual stillness, as though it held its breath. A subtle movement caught my eye something vast shifting between trees at a distance too far to discern features but large enough to send alarm bells ringing. Assisting the distraught hiker back to safety took precedence over everything else. As we neared base camp, she recounted her day before meeting me, laughing about how she teased her friend for being overly cautious about wildlife. The sun dipped lower, and shadows stretched like reaching fingers across our path when it happened, a crack not made by human footsteps echoed through the surrounding woods. Naima growled lowly, every muscle in her body tensing as we stopped dead in our tracks. Peering into the encroaching darkness beyond our light's reach revealed little except for two reflective pinpricks staring back at us. The creature's eyes, I could see nothing else, watched with patient curiosity or perhaps calculation. I don't know what that is. I murmured to both Naima and our rescued guests, trying to inject some lightness into my voice with a wry joke about wishing it was just an oddly shaped boulder. We picked up pace, making it back to camp where other rangers were organizing search teams for the missing persons report now on my hands. As night fell fully, Unease settled onto camp like dew. Silent nods exchanged more words than any conversation could. Organizing into pairs armed for potential bear encounters. It seemed logical given what evidence we had. We ventured back out into blackened woods where creatures of shadow roamed free under starlights in different gaze. None voiced it, yet we all knew there exist horrors beyond bears lurking hidden by darkness cover. Near one remote creek bed where moonlight failed to penetrate dense canopy above, we discovered clothing, not torn by brambles or harsh landings from falls, but shredded methodically with precision suggesting intelligence behind malicious intent. Silence fell among us, a language unto itself, drowning sounds of running water nearby as our minds recoiled from implications woven within tattered fabric remnants before us. Forced forward by duty's unrelenting grasp, we split further searching high-probability areas while simultaneously praying each turn wouldn't reveal reality's nightmares given form. With only brief nods to companionship and safety's illusion amidst unknowable wilderness expanse, 
quiet acknowledgments passed through weary glances signaled shared fears without igniting panic's flame, already flickering thinly veiled beneath stoic exteriors. Suddenly snapping twigs shattered fragile tranquility again, this time closer and without thought save survival instinct driving actions swiftly executed. I raised my firearm toward unseen threats haunting periphery's edge. The forest grew still, the sound of a branch breaking piercing through the calm. Hearts raced, eyes scanned through the dark. Near feet in front of us, something moved, a figure either animal nor man. Its large silhouette stood against the less dark background, Claws visible and horrific, sharp and cruel, covered in what seemed like blood. A whisper traveled among us. Back to camp! But fear rooted some in place, like statues bearing witness to an unspeakable truth. I moved without thinking, pushing whoever was nearby toward what I hoped was safety. Then came screams, pain, guttural, from behind. I turned in time to see a companion fall, the creature upon him with ferocity that chilled the very air. He had no chance. His name was Eric, and he would not rise again. We didn't call for help. There was no signal here, no ranger nearby, and every second spent hesitating meant more danger, more death. So we ran, careening through undergrowth toward flickering campfire light that promised life. Breaths came heavy as we burst into camp with news that needed no words. The tears on faces said enough. Two were lost now, Eric and Amanda. There were decisions made in haste, to leave at first light since darkness was the creature's veil. Hours passed with every twig snap sending shockwaves through spines. No sleep for those who survived, dawn came like a savior. We left our gear and took only memories seared into minds, memories of those taken by something we could not comprehend but would never forget, a nightmare creature whose kind I could only speculate as we put miles between us and that cursed place. The journey back was silent save for the crunch of earth underfoot. We spoke little of it after returning to a world too normal to understand such horrors the territory of nightmares that had breached reality's fence. Our group disbanded with nods instead of words. What shared terror we had required no vocalization to understand its depth. Time might dull the images but never erase them nor the final glance back at woods that hid secrets and shadows, belonging to creatures we hoped never to meet again. I never thought it would happen to me. I was just an ordinary guy from Oklahoma, working a dead-end job in a small-town hardware store. My name is Cyrus Joplin, and little did I know, this day would forever change my life. One morning, I set off on a hike at Beaver's Bend State Park, a place I was familiar with, having spent countless weekends exploring its various trails. The weather was perfect for it, not too hot, not too cold. Just right. As I trekked through the lush green forest, I struck up a conversation with another hiker. Her name was Ramona Driscoll, an old friend from high school that had moved away after we graduated. We hadn't seen each other in years, and it was a great opportunity to catch up during our hike. We chatted about the good old days, shared some jokes about our mutual friends, and went down memory lane. It felt like only minutes had passed when we noticed how late it had already grown. Glancing around us as dusk crept in, we realized that we'd wandered far from the main trail. It didn't take long for our laughter to die down as darkness began to envelop the forest. The distant howl of what sounded like a wounded animal echoed ominously through the otherwise silent woods. Ramona looked worried, but I tried to reassure her that it was probably just a coyote, nothing we couldn't handle. As the sun sank further below the horizon, 
We focused on finding our way back by sticking together and using the moonlight to illuminate our surroundings. Soon enough, though, we stumbled upon something that would haunt us for the rest of our days. The remains of a dismembered deer lay scattered across our path, its viscera strewn across the ground like some grotesque painting on Mother Earth's canvas. Ramona gagged at the sight, and I couldn't blame her. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before. We decided to continue our trek back to the trail, carrying a sense of unease that intensified with each step. The distant howls grew louder, and I began to feel as if I could hear them echoing in my very chest. It wasn't long before we heard branches snapping in the distance, followed by an overpowering odor of decay that seemed to assault our senses from every direction. We stared at each other, too frightened to say anything when we heard the breathing, raspy, ragged breaths drawing closer on all fours. The creature emerged from the shadows, unlike anything either of us had ever seen, a monstrous predator twisted by years of torment and hunger. Its piercing gaze burrowed into mine as its fetid breath washed over my face like a deathly caress. Its enormous size cast an imposing shadow over both Ramona and me. We stood frozen in horror for what felt like an eternity before instinct finally kicked in. Our legs sprang to life in unison, propelling us away from the beast with newfound speed and adrenaline pumping through our veins. The forest became a blur as we ran for our lives, desperately trying to escape this nightmare brought forth from hell itself. We didn't dare call for help, as we knew the monster would hear us. The thick forest seemed to close in on us as we ran, the endless and twisted shadows mocking our fear. Our breaths came in gasping heaves I didn't know how much further we could run until exhaustion would get the better of us. Our fears started to escalate when Ramona stumbled over a gnarled root and cried out in pain. As she struggled to rise from the ground, I heard the creature's relentless pursuit approaching closer and closer. I grabbed her hand and pulled her to her feet, helping her keep up with me despite her pain limping. I couldn't help but notice how grotesque this being looked in flashes whenever it caught up. It had gaunt skin that hung loosely off its bony, canine-like frame. Its eyes were bewilderingly human-like but held an almost sinister intelligence. After nearly an eternity of running, Ramona implored between gasps that we had to find shelter where we could hide until the creature gave up. We spotted a small cave hidden behind some shrubbery nearby and rushed inside, hoping beyond hope that we had found salvation from our seemingly indefatigable pursuer. We remained silent inside that cave, our panicked breaths almost thunderous in my ears. Minutes turned into what felt like hours, our bodies tensed with anticipation as we listened intently for any sounds of the creature outside. Any rustle of leaves or snapping branch set my entire body on high alert. It may have been luck or fate, but eventually, the snarling and breathing seemed to move away from our hideout. However, without any certainty that the monster had left entirely— we barely dared breathe while cramped within that small space. When our sense of safety slowly returned in increments, I tried to formulate a plan to help Ramona seek medical attention for her now visibly swollen ankle. We needed to make it back to the trail and find another group of hikers who could provide her with assistance. As we gingerly exited the cave, I silently marveled at how relatively unharmed we had been during this frightening encounter despite our ignorance regarding folklore creatures. But I knew that our lives couldn't continue like this, and an overwhelming sense of responsibility to establish some semblance of normalcy for Ramona and myself settled upon my shoulders. We managed to hike through the forest, our path illuminated by my cell phone's flashlight. Our progress was slow, as Ramona's swelling ankle hindered her mobility significantly. 
We were so focused on putting distance between the creature and ourselves that we barely noticed the dilapidated cabin tucked away in the trees. With caution, we approached it and found an elderly man inside. With great trepidation, I explained our unnerving encounter with the monster. To my surprise, he acknowledged understanding and began scribbling out a detailed sketch of our fearsome antagonist. He then consulted various ancient-looking books scattered throughout his humble abode before identifying our pursuer, a creature known as a wendigo in local folklore a twisted monstrosity created when man engaged in cannibalism during times of desperation. As terror washed over us both at this revelation, the old man shared with us valuable knowledge regarding the wendigo's weaknesses and limitations in hopes of helping us evade it once more. Though this was far beyond any rational understanding either of us ever possessed, we listened closely and committed his recommendations to memory. Our escape from that forest will always haunt me, but thanks to the information given by that mysterious older man, we managed to avoid a grisly fate at the hands of the Wendigo. When we finally emerged from those woods, bruised, battered, and weary yet alive we knew we would never forget what occurred in those dark, twisted shadows. I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling as I drove into the remote town of Joshua Hills. My name is Sullivan Bryce, journalist by trade with a penchant for unraveling mysteries. On this particular assignment, my editor sent me to this small Nevada town to cover a puzzling string of unexplained events. Upon arrival at the local hotel, I struck up a conversation with the man behind the counter. Reggie Peters was his name, and he proceeded to detail some strange incidents that had recently been occurring. Folks disappearing into thin air, livestock mauled without explanation, and eerie sightings on the outskirts of town. My curiosity piqued. I decided to explore these claims further with the help of some locals. That's when I met Jackie Turnbull and her son Kyle. They claimed to have seen it the elusive creature believed to be at the heart of the problem in Joshua Hills. They described it as a massive, hairless beast with razor-sharp claws and piercing red eyes. A chill ran down my spine as Kyle recounted an incident just last week. He was out by old man Whitaker's farm when he heard something stalking him in the brush. Kyle wanted to call for help but limited cell service and fear gripped him. All he could do was hide as it passed by. He noticed an odd smell emanating from the creature, like burning leaves. Despite my skepticism, I couldn't deny that their story was hauntingly plausible. We agreed to team up and investigate Joshua Hill's mysterious antagonist further. Our search led us to an encounter with another eyewitness named Sarah Donnelly. She swore she had narrowly escaped after being cornered by the creature. As I stood there, trembling behind some rocks, Sarah whispered, I aimed my flashlight right at its face. It hissed at me like a snake before darting back into the shadows. The more we learned about this animalistic menace, the more I found myself questioning my belief in the logical and rational. With every interview, we seemed to uncover something new, yet no closer to finding any tangible evidence of its existence. The locals had grown increasingly distressed and unwilling to venture out alone after dark. Joshua Hills was paralyzed in fear, but I couldn't shake off my stubborn skepticism. We spent days scouring the desolate landscape, hoping for clues, yet found nothing conclusive. On our last day of searching, Reggie called me frantically. Sullivan, he panted, you've got to come to the diner. Rita, she's gone missing. I desperately asked if he was certain that the creature was behind it. As a father of two himself, Reggie's voice held concern for his friend's well-being and frustration over this ever-growing mystery. 
Nothing else could have taken her like this, he explained as dread settled into my chest. As Jackie, Kyle, Sarah, Reggie, and I stood in what remained of the diner's back room, I could hardly comprehend the destruction before us. The room was torn apart as if a tornado had struck it. Walls collapsed, tables overturned, an acrid smell of burnt wood and metal filled our nostrils. I tried to stay focused on our task at hand as Kyle quipped cynically about how they'd never find a place that served double-stacked pancakes quite like Rita had made them. We each shared our theories about where the frightening beast might be hiding, all distinct but cementing that it wasn't safe here anymore. Determined not to abandon Rita and deny this creature any more terror over Joshua Hills, we trailed its path far into the Nevada wilderness. With every step further from civilization and safety, my heart began pounding harder. I couldn't silence my inner voice telling me we were out of our depth. As darkness fell and shadows stretched across our path like gaunt fingers, we finally stumbled upon a grisly scene. The fire still smoldered where Rita's limp form lay among a shredded campsite. I suppressed my nausea and emotions. There was no time for that now. Time stood still as the all-consuming terror that had been lurking on the fringes of my perception snapped into focus and I beheld the monstrous creature before us. It towered over our motley crew, claws extended and eyes burning like red-hot coals. Staying in a tight formation, we inched closer to the towering creature. The scales on its back shimmered green and black, its muscular tail thrashing, ready to strike. It bared its razor-sharp teeth, each one as long as my forearm. Kyle squeezed the branch he'd picked up earlier. I could tell he was scared, but we couldn't leave Rita's body to this beast. It roared at us menacingly, festering saliva dripping from its mouth, pooling on the ground and sizzling on the dry earth. My breath quickened. I could feel the urge to run tugging at me, but knew it would mean leaving my friends behind. I shouted above the roar. Kyle! Bella! We need to distract it while one of us grabs Rita. They nodded in agreement. Without a plan, we made our move. Bella began pelting it with rocks she'd collected earlier while Kyle waved his makeshift weapon and yelled loudly to draw its attention. The creature swiped at him with massive claws. Risking everything, I dashed forward and wrenched Rita from its grasp. The pain etched across her face told me it was too late. Reluctantly dragging her body away from the sight of carnage, I heard rustling behind me. Bella and Kyle had managed to disengage and were following me swiftly. You grabbed Rita! Bella exclaimed breathlessly as we continued our escape into the darkening night. Helplessness washed over me as they questioned what could have possibly led us here and what kind of creature we'd encountered. We need help. I murmured, realizing the extent of the monster's brutality would require a larger force than just us three. But with no cell reception deep in the Nevada wilderness and our nearest neighbor miles away from town, by the time any assistance arrived, it might be futile. Pressing onwards, we quietly navigated through the dark trees, all past disagreements forgotten in the face of our shared nightmare. The following evening, we reached the outskirts of another town, shivering from cold and exhaustion. Bursting through the door of a diner, we recounted our tale to the stunned locals. Sounds like a kyrig, said one of them, a calloused outdoorsman with years of wilderness experience behind him. It's an ancient creature from around these parts. They say it was once human. That it was cursed long ago, forced to stalk the land as a beast. But how do we stop it? Kyle's eyes filled with desperation, wondering if there was anything that could help protect Joshua Hills and its inhabitants. The outdoorsman looked at us solemnly. The Kyrig is immune to our weapons. But legend says it's frightened by fire. 
the last sighting decades ago was driven off by setting the surrounding area alight. Hope swelled within me. If this had worked before, maybe it could save us too. We formulated our plan and returned to Joshua Hills with as many willing townsfolk as we could muster. When night fell, the Kyrig emerged once more from its lair, brazenly striding through town as if it belonged there. Armed with makeshift flamethrowers and torches, our motley crew confronted the beast as a united front. Instantly, fear rippled across its scaled skin, and its fiery eyes widened at the sight of flame. Roaring in terror, it turned tail and fled into the night until it disappeared entirely. As our community began piecing together shattered lives and rebuilding from the ashes left behind by the Kyrig's rampage, we honored Rita's memory in a somber ceremony. Those who had stood beside me against this monstrous enemy became lifelong friends. Their valor and courage recounted in Joshua Hill's folklore for years to come. Though no one else dared to speak it aloud, every so often I found myself wondering if the Kyrig may be lurking just beyond our borders, waiting for another chance to wreak havoc and grant another victim's final wish.